for the mispronunciation of your name. It's okay. <laughs> Hey, Trina. Hi, Steve. Hola, amigos. Hi, William. Good to see you, Mr. Vega. Oh, pleasure. It's all mine. Hey, is that you? Are you, uh, are you are you connected with us? Maybe not. Steve, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, Steve. Yes, I'm here. I'm gonna okay, come great, on camera. Great. Can you see me? Uh no, I just uh I hear you, but no, I don't see your video yet. All right, I'm under McClure R. Okay. Can you see me now? Yes. Okay, great. Great. I want to see if I turn the light off. If the light was giving a glare. All right. So we still have a have a few minutes to go here. Okay. Like to see a few more committee members file in. Yeah. How, how many are we up to? We're up to three. Oh. Plus plus one board member. <laughs> how many is there quorum, Steve? Six. I see Laura. Mm -hmm. Hi, Trina. Hey, how are you, Laura? Nice Good to see you. you. Same here. Hanging in there. Hi, Laura. William. Hi. <coughs> oh, 
All right, good Dan, Dan Grossman. Good to see you. Hello. And Mr. Brissetis. Uh, then we got Mr. Hi, Eric. Mr. Elkins. All right, so we have a quorum. Good. Laura. And and Steve, a uh, speaker will be driving for us in the presentation. Pardon? See a Piper. I see a Piper. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So in a moment, yeah, we'll. Uh, okay. We'll give her permission. Um, uh, Marie. Uh, Ms. Piper will be handling this, the presentation. So she has the controls. When, okay, great. Uh, she's ready. Great. Okay. It, I'll be watching to see if there's an issue. Okay. We'll just wait another moment or two here and then we'll. Uh, great. Thank you. We'll... Uh, there are some people who signed on with just telephones. I don't know who they are. So if they're board members, they have to uh, identify themselves. Right. All right. Okay, I think we're we're going to move move forward. Um, hi everyone, welcome to the uh, Environmental Protection Committee of Community Board One. Um, here on uh, May twenty seventh, and so tonight we're we're going to hear a presentation from National Grid on their uh, the upgrade to their vaporizers at the Greenpoint facility. And then we'll uh, have the field questions from the committee and board members and then the uh, uh, the attendees. And just, you know, just some kind of ground rules. And, and then following that, we'll, um, the committee will have a discussion uh, about the item and determine whether we want to want to pass the resolution. And then there are additional items. Um, Solid Waste Advisory Board Organic Committee is here. They're going to present. And then updates from North Brooklyn Neighbors and Newtown Beach Alliance. And then we'll look into old business and new business. And then just um, just some you know, housekeeping uh, rules or just you know kind of the way of the land is. Um, when we, you know, everyone can please remain muted until, you know, if they're intending to speak, then they can, you know, unmute themselves. And then when we, you know, and I'll, I'll repeat this again, but when you when you're interested in asking a question after the uh, the committee and board members, uh, raise your hand with the if you're on a desktop or laptop, there's a little smiley face, which is the reaction button. You click on that and you have the ability to raise your hand. And then after you um, after you've asked your question, if you could click that button again to lower your hand. Um, I believe on the on phones, it's the uh, more button. We'll get we'll get you there. And then just you know keep if you could just in your mind as you're formulating your questions, keep the you know very succinct, laser focused. Um, you know, it looks like you know we're you know, our, our numbers are growing, so we. Um, you know, we do. I do have a time frame in mind for for the national grid item, so we can, um, you know, address the other items on the agenda. And so, uh, with all that said, uh, Marie, could you please take the uh, the role for the uh, committee? Stephen Chesla. Yeah. Eric Brusitis. Eric. Eric, I can see you, but I don't hear you. Here? Okay. 
Yes. T. Willis Elkins. Here. William Clagsbold. Nope, not present. Um, Yoel Lowe. Not present. Trina McKeever. Here. Janice Peterson. Not present. Bella Sable. Bella. No answer. Laura Hoffman. Here. Is my answer. Kevin Costa. Here. Where are you, Kevin? I heard you say here, but I don't see you. Daniel Grossman. Here. You have seven members present. Okay, that's great. Thank you. All right, uh, National Grid, please take it away with your presentation. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Good evening to everyone in attendance. My name is Renee McClure, and I'm the manager of community and customer management for National Grid. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Community Board uh, Environmental Protection Committee for the opportunity to share important information on our clean energy plan, as well as provide an update and clarify the work we're doing at our Greenpoint Energy Center facility. Today's uh, agenda will consist of a few areas, and I'm gonna start it off with Brian Gimaldi, who is our Vice President of Corporate Affairs. He will provide some opening remarks, followed by Chris Conley, our Vice President of Gas Operations, to provide an update on the Vaporizer Project, and then Don Shabazzport, our Director of Regulatory and Delivery and Strategy to discuss our clean energy efforts. So we just want to thank you in advance for your attendance and we'll look forward to uh, following up with questions at the end. So Brian. Thank you, Renee. Good, good evening, everyone. I'm happy to be here. My name is Brian Grimaldi. I'm the new Vice President of Corporate Affairs for National Grid for New York. I want to thank both the Environmental Chair and the Board Chair Fuller for this presentation opportunity. You know, a lot's happened since we last presented to you in January of 2020. Rudy Winter, as of April 1st, is the new president of the New York Business for National Grid. He started in Brooklyn, Brooklyn Union Gas as an engineer at a college. He's a resident of Brooklyn, and he understands the needs of this community. Our team at National Grid is committed to actively participating in the public process, to delivering on our promises, and being a good citizen. And a lot to be said about National Grid, and I should be clear, you know, we embrace a net zero future. It's essential to our planet. Clean energy projects create jobs, spur economic development in our communities, and we're aligned with New York's clean energy goals, doing our part to ensure that we're mitigating our emissions. And those are our customers, as shown by our own net zero plan, which is available on our website. National Grid is also aligned with New York State and New York City, who have established goals for economy-wide decarbonization models. So, if there's another message I'd like to leave you with here today. It's that we're committed to the energy transition and net zero, and we're available at any time to answer your questions, address your concerns, and we hope you'll reach out to get information about National Grid or our work directly from us. And I say that because unfortunately there has been some misleading and inaccurate information out there about our projects and our commitment to energy transition, and we wanna make sure we correct those instances when they arise. And that said, we're not here to argue with those who disagree with us. We simply want to continue a fair, even toned and equitable conversation. We partner with environmental organizations regularly, so obviously we realize that not everyone agrees on all issues. We also recognize that there are some organizations and members of the community that may never agree with National Grid or our business. Some of these organizations oppose the Greenpoint Energy Center and upgrading the existing infrastructure because in their view, these projects would hamper the transition to net zero. However, that view does not take into account the need to provide service to existing customers safely and reliably as we transition. So while reasonable people can differ on the exact road to net zero, we hope it's clear that we can all agree that the ultimate need is to get there. And National Grid is committed to doing that together. For example, we collaborated with the Mayor's Office of Sustainability and Con Ed with regard to the Pathways to Carbon Neutral NYC, a study which you'll hear more in a few minutes. The study identified pathways that the city could pursue 
to effectively reach the carbonization goals while maintaining safe, affordable, and reliable delivery of energy for all New Yorkers. The study was broadly supported by organizations such as the global consulting firm ICF, Energy Futures Initiatives, and Drexel University. It is the most comprehensive analysis to date of viable scenarios for New York City's energy supply and demand through 2050, including identifying potential costs. Columbia University published a similar study right after Pathways was issued, largely validating these findings. Pathways to net zero is complicated. However, it must be orderly, formed by science, and ensure that all New Yorkers are able to join us on the journey. These are serious times to require serious conversation. We've reached out to the leaders of the environmental groups, many of whom appeared at this community board on January 20th, 2020, to oppose our projects, to ask them for a meeting individually. It's our hope and expectation to open a productive dialogue, find common ground, and partner on an orderly transition to our net zero future. So tonight you'll hear from the National Grid team. We'll discuss updates at the Greenpoint Energy Center. We'll give you a window into the findings of the Pathway Report. We'll share our energy transition investments. And we'll be here to answer your questions. My only ask is that you listen, keep an open mind, and treat our people fairly. Thank you for listening. I'll now turn it over to Chris Connolly for an update on the Greenpoint Energy Center. Thank you, Brian. Good evening to the committee and attendees. My name is Chris Connolly. I'm the vice president of gas network operations at National Grid. I have responsibility for our gas control operations, LNG and CNG assets, as well as our pressure regulating facilities. I'm a mechanical engineer by trade and have over 20 years experience in the industry in gas utility operations and engineering functions uh, across the Northeast. So we are proud of our track record. Over 50 years of safe and reliable operations at our Greenpoint LNG facility. The origins of national of New York Na national gas distribution system are linked back to this location. We utilize the stored energy to support our customers during the coldest days of the winter heating season. The plant operates infrequently. Vaporizers are only operated when needed based on forecasted demand. And as such, the role of the LNG plant is critical in the overall natural gas supply portfolio. That's why Vaporizer 13 and 14 project is such an integral part of our solution to support continued reliability for our customers for the coming winters. The work we've progressed with DEC, the application for the downgrade of our existing Title V air permit to a state facility air permit caps our current and future emissions at the plant by approximately 50%. We will operate under that threshold with the addition of Vaporizer 13 and 14. The Vaporizer 13 and 14 project is part of the non-pipeline solution included in the 2020 report presented to the state. The project is based on detailed analysis and extensive public feedback. If you go to the next slide. As an energy service provider, for you, we must provide reliable service to all of our customers and we are responsible for the distribution infrastructure in and across our service territory to meet those needs. We have an obligation to serve. This is our franchise agreement with the state as a gas utility. Our commitment is to forecast and plan for inclement weather, abnormal events that may interrupt supply from upstream energy providers to ensure that we can successfully deliver to every customer. The vaporizer project we are proposing at our Greenpoint Energy Center underpins our responsibility to deliver very specific projects addressing a need to provide safe, reliable, and affordable clean energy. Next slide, please. So, National Grid is committed to communicating more frequently and effectively with the communities in which we operate. That's why we're here this evening with all of you. So, I want to reinforce a few facts with the LNG Vaporizer project. So, this project will not increase annual output or increase frequency of plant operations. We will not increase LNG storage. This is not an expansion of the Greenpoint Energy Center. The equipment that we are installing as part of the project, those being the vaporizers, are the most efficient units available in the market, achieving approximately 96% efficiency. Now, there's an analogy here on the slide to help everyone's understanding of what the project does. Adding the vaporizers is similar to opening an additional exit gate at the end of a sporting event 
which allows for the same amount of LNG to move out of the storage and into the distribution system more quickly. So this is part of our transition. We support the shift away from carbon-based fuels. That's why it is so important to continue to forecast, plan, and invest in infrastructure. And I'll add modern infrastructure now to ensure the needs of our customers will be met in the future. So with that said, thank you. And now is a good segue. I'm going to turn to my colleague, Don Shapotskor, to update you on the clean energy commitment for National Grid. Great. Thank you, Chris. Hi, good evening, everyone. A pleasure to be here. My name is Don Shabazzpour. I work out of a regulatory strategy group in Brooklyn. Um, so you just heard my colleague, Chris, talk about a very specific project, you know, the Greenpoint uh, vaporizer project. I wanted to give you a perspective of sort of the big picture, right? So let's just zoom out you know, a bit in terms of the big landscape. Where is National Grid going? Where are we heading as a company? Um, as you all know, New York State has committed to net zero, so has the city of New York. We have made our own net zero plan, which we released in October of 2020. I do remember actually presenting to this community board a few years ago, and we had talked about net zero, and there is a difference. When the last time that I presented to the community board one, and we talked about our net zero, at that time was companies' own emission. This net zero plan that which we released in October it is, we are, it is inclusive of the emissions of our customers that the product we sell. So in other words, the emissions as a result of using natural gas and electricity in the entire US is picked up by this net zero plan, which makes it far more ambitious and, and, and aggressive. Uh, and, and we came up with a 10 point pillar plan. You can find on our website how we get there. And in terms of, so I think the next critical question, as you hear a lot of these sort of announcements, is how do you get there is the really tricky part. And here, I think the city of New York is ahead of the curve. And as you heard Brian mentioned this, uh, we worked on a project here, the collective we, Con Edison, and the Mayor's Office of Sustainability. We spent two years in a really in-depth detailed study, which you can find on, uh, on the, the Mayor's Office of Sustainability website for the entire report. How do we actually get there? We used a consulting team. It, it, it was inclusive of ICF. They did all of the anal analysis, Energy Futures Initiative. They did all the strategic thinking and the convening of the stakeholders. Energy Futures Initiatives is the organization led by the previous Secretary of Energy, Secretary Moniz, and Drexel University, which did a lot of the literature review around the world and around the country, country. And we also selected them due to their expertise in buildings. And as we are all aware, New York City is a city with a lot of buildings. We also engaged a really robust technical advisory committee. It had 25 members. It included members from local New York City organizations. We brought environmental organizations such as NRDC, EDF. We also brought really the who's who of the energy industry in terms of academics. We had professors from Columbia University and as far as Stanford, Berkeley, and we also brought scientists from NREL, DOE, one of the Department of Energy's national laboratories. So this techn the technical advisory committee was, the report is not really is endorsed by them, but we engaged them to make sure that we are not missing anything in terms of technology and the latest thinking and bringing other stakeholders into this discussion. The purpose of the study was really, if you wanna you know, think about it in a, sentence was to do our homework. We wanted to create an, an, an analytical body of work that provides insights. How do we get there over the next three decades? What are our options? What are the risks? And what are the trade-offs? So let's dig a little deeper into the study. And here I'm just, I will mention that I will focus only from, from our perspective, meaning the gas utilities perspective. The study is very detailed. It covers every sector of the, that has emissions in New York City. So I'll just focus on, again, from the perspective of the gas network and how that transforms. First, I would say that we looked at three pathways. The study has an electrification pathway, low carbon fuels, and diversified. Diversified pathway is really the combination of the previous two. Electrification, the low carbon fuels pathway, get you to about 80% emission reductions by 2050, and a diversified pathway gets you to about 90%. And then the study mentions in order to get to net zero, the city really needs to start thinking about other 
what I would describe as large scale carbon management technologies, which includes really offsets and carbon capture technologies. Regardless of the pathway, the study basically is concluding that you need all of these tools and there's different, you know, in each pathway to the degree which we use them. For example, the electrification range, electrification of heat ranges somewhere between 30% in the low carbon fuels pathway to 60% in the electrification pathway. But regardless of the pathway, we will, need, we will need all of these tools in addition to other tools that we need to innovate over the next 30 years and begin to scale them. This third bullet really distills the transformation of the gas network and where we're going over the next 30 years, which means to the comment that Chris just mentioned, we will begin to swap out really the fossil fuel, the molecules that are being delivered today, what we were calling here low carbon gases, which is renewable natural gas from sustainable biomass feedstocks. For example, the Newtown Creek that will utilize two feedstocks, food waste and wastewater and hydrogen. In our study, hydrogen, <coughs> I do wanna indicate for those of you that are um, more familiar with different flavors of, flavors of hydrogen, this is green hydrogen, hydrogen that is derived from renewable electricity. The study concludes that the total gas demand, regardless of the pathway in all sectors, gets cut by about 60% by 2050. It is different by each sector. You can go through the study to look at it by sector. But I will say the one sector that has the biggest drop in natural gas demand in New York City is the power generation sector. And that actually has the deepest demand, uh, the steepest demand drop over the next 10 years. And by 2040, the study concludes in all the pathways that we are no longer using natural gas to produce electricity. All of that by 2040 changes to either renewable natural gas or hydrogen. And because the electrification ranges somewhere between the 30 to 60 percent, there is the future is you know not no gas, there is low gas. So we need to continue investment in the gas infrastructure to provide the safety and the reliability. And the other sort of major conclusion from the study from the gas networks perspective is that it has an enduring role and it actually plays an integral role in supporting achieving that zero targets. Also, regardless of the pathway that is selected, um, the study does conclude in order to deliver you know, reliable and affordable energy, we need to make sure that it is equitable and it does not leave anyone behind. I do want to conclude that the study actually does not make any policy recommendations. As I mentioned, this study was really doing our homework, but local law 97, We'll be looking at this study. This study actually satisfies a requirement of local law 97. In other words, local law 97 required a study that, such as this. And also the New York City Mayor's Office will be using this to produce their long-term energy plan. So this concludes you know, my former part of the presentation. And now I'll look forward to answering your questions. And with that, Renee, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Don. Thanks, everyone. So um, I hope we find this information shed some light on our plans for both the Greenpoint facility and our clean uh, energy initiatives. We look forward to continuing this conversation with our communities. And we thank you again, and thanks again to the Environmental Protection Committee for giving us this opportunity to speak. And before we conclude, I'd like to uh, end our, our, our presentation with a video. So I see us. Yes, share my screen now. Apologies. They're easy to spot, even in a crowd. They run toward problems, not away from them. Showing up when others won't or can't. They feel responsible for the rest of us. The national grid has more than our fair share of them because we know you depend on us to make your home warm, your drinks cold, and your light shine. Not oh, some of the time, or most of the time, but all of the time. And now you're depending on us to give you cleaner energy. So we're investing our resources into natural resources, like solar and wind power. Because if there's one thing we believe, it's this. We don't only have a responsibility to our generation, but the next one. We can't help it. 
We're just wired that way. National Grid. Responsibility calls. Um, thank you, Steve. Okay. Thank you, Thea. Uh, thank you, Steve. And so we're going to turn it back over to you. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Renee and, and your team for the presentation. Really appreciate that. Um, so to start things off, to any of the uh, committee members or yeah, start with the committee members if they have any questions for for National Grid. I have a question. Yeah. Could um, could the people from National Grid explain what goes on in the Greenpoint facility? Is it just the storing of the LNG, or what else happens there? Yeah, Chris here. I'm happy to pick that up from National Grid. So uh, our Greenpoint Energy Center provides for storage of LNG uh, during the off-peak season, and we use that storage, that liquid, to vaporize during the coldest days of the winter. So it's a storage facility, but we also have the equipment to be able to vaporize that liquid into a gas form and send it out into our distribution system to serve our customers. Are the trucks fueled there? Uh, no, there are no trucks that that uh, you know enter the site or, or leave the site. So we have no trucking activities with the Greenpoint Energy Center. Okay. Yeah, well, along those lines. So, do you have any intention of utilizing trucks to transport um, LNG? So we do not have intention to use trucks to transport LNG. Uh, while we do have a project, and, and that's out of scope for tonight's discussion, but I'll share with you, we do have a project to replace an existing truck station that we have at the Greenpoint Energy Center to uh, modernize what we have there. Then that, that would provide us for emergency purposes only in the future, such that if we could not fill the tanks or be able to vaporize, that we could we could truck LNG in to fill the, to fill the tanks. So that would only be used on emergency purposes only in the future. It's an asset we've had in service ever since the plant was constructed. And, and that's a project that, that we have, you know, moving forward for the future. Okay. So, can go I follow up on that? Yeah, go for it, Willis. Just, so to clarify, you're saying that currently you have an LNG trucking facility that's been in operation since the plant's been in operation. Is that correct? We, we have an LNG trucking facility that was constructed when the plant was put into service. Correct. That that facility is actually hasn't been used in many many years, um, and it's 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 decommissioned. But you know that's what we have in place today. The asset is still there. So explain to me how how a facility that has not been used in I don't know how many years exactly. Maybe you could provide some details to how many times in the entire existence of the LNG facility you've used that trucking depot. And why you would be rebuilding a decommissioned facility, uh, and also please acknowledge the fact that ship that trucking LNG is illegal on city streets. Can you please rectify those scenarios to us? Sure. So I can address the first part of your question. So um, I, I don't know when the last time we trucked LNG. I believe it was used on one or two occasions only in the life of the plant. Right. I will tell you that the system currently is decommissioned, but we see this as an important asset. To provide for an emergency backup if we ever need it in the future and that's the purpose of the truck station it's purely for supply contingency for resiliency to make sure that if we have a problem with being able to fill our tanks to allow for vaporization during the winter months to provide that extra source of supply into our system to serve our customers that we have it there as a backup and that's the purpose of the truck station so can you please acknowledge and also explain why trucking lng is illegal on new york city streets so there's, there's been, you know, for a number of years since the 70s, you know, inability to truck through New York City, right? That's a that's out of scope for tonight's discussion. Um, you know, I think I've, I've answered your questions that you have. Um, we're continuing to work with the city and state agencies uh, for the future on the potential for LNG trucking. But as of today, we, we do not have the ability to truck LNG through the city. You're, you're correct in that. So I would just like to note for those who are attending and unfamiliar, LNG is incredibly hazardous material and national good. You're, you're free to refute this or, you know, discuss this if you like, but this is a highly volatile, dangerous material. And there's a reason why siting of these facilities is severely restricted in New York city and why the trucking of it is severely restricted. So I don't understand how you expect us to sort of just like not along with the fact that you want to, uh, 
recreate a facility that hasn't been in use for many years and is highly dangerous to the community. So again, while I, I don't know if there was a question in there, um, but we you know we've made our statements on the future of of the LNG uh, trucking station, and you know we we disagree with the assertion that it's unsafe. Uh, we've we've had very successful operations in the Northeast with LNG trucking for for many many years. Can you tell us how many people died in the Staten Island facility explosion in the 1970s at the LNG uh, plant? I don't have that number with me, but I do know that that. Uh, event that occurred in Staten Island was unrelated to LNG. Okay, can you explain the other Staten Island LNG facility that was uh, not actually finished being built in Rossville and why that was the case? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the history on that facility. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll yield my time to other people because I know there's a lot of folks that want to also ask questions. Yeah, thank you. Hey, I'd just like to follow up on the, uh, the safety issue. Um, I too, you know, just in doing my research, noticed there just have been, you know, some really, you know, really uh, intensely severe accidents related to LNG explosions in Cleveland, where it was one example, and in Washington State. And yeah, I know this facility has been operational since the 60s, um, but I have to wonder how many people really, really knew that. So again, I was just wondering if you could overall just address um, safety with um, you know, just the operational of this facility, and then if it is indeed uh, the vaporizers are modified, um, but you know what that what we'll do in, in the safety issue because it is you know an incredibly volatile substance, and um, and 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 just in the area that it's located, there you know just there are um, you know oil distribution and storage, um, and I believe you know chemical. You know, storage and um, you know type facilities. So, uh, if you could please address that, that'd be good. Oh, well, that, that, sorry, that was a long statement in there. I don't know what where the question was in, in your statement, Steve. Well, I was just wondering, in light of the, the examples of the uh, of the ac LNG related accidents at other facilities, I mentioned Cleveland and Washington State. How is the Greenpoint facility? I mean, in terms of Having knowledge of those accidents or other accidents has um, national grid implemented safety measures and modifications or, you know, to prevent something like that happening. Um, or, you know, how is that you know, built into to the system? Well, I can't speak to the other events and the other owners of the LNG facilities. You know, I can speak to the fact that we have a very robust. Um, safety protocols in place. We're a regulated utility. We're inspected regularly, um, and, and you know, so safety is our for, first and foremost, um, you know, uh, approach to anything we do at our LNG facilities or with any of our assets. So you know, we, we take safety most important. We're upgrading our assets. We're inspecting our assets. We're modernizing the equipment we have, and we're putting into place all the safety protocols that we need to maintain and to continue to reliably. Uh, run these plants. You know, Greenpoint is one out of 12 LNG facilities that we have uh, under National Grid in the U.S., and we have a very good track record at all of them. Hi, this is Kevin. I have a quick question. Actually, a couple, if I may. Um, who, is that? who is that? Who is that? Who is speaking, please? Kevin Costa. Oh, hi. Thanks, Kevin. All right. Awesome. Um, so, first off, um, what is the useful life of the, the vaporizers that are proposed? Um, that's my first question. Um, another one is getting back to the like stadium analogy that was used previously. Why is National Grid's focus instead of adding additional exit gates, if you will, instead not reducing the size of the stadium and reducing the size of the stadium as fast as possible to eliminate the need of adding in additional exit gates, if you will, using your own analogy, um, and then. My third question is, does National Grid um, publicly oppose um, like a, a moratorium on, on new, national, uh, new natural gas connections for um, residential buildings? Thanks. Well, I'm gonna work from your last question back to the first, and you may have to remind me again on the first question once I get there. So, you know, the last question with respect to we oppose moratoriums on, on new gas hookups, I think is what you said. So, you know, National Grid is an energy service provider 
uh, for our downstate New York service territory, including Brooklyn. You know, we serve all customers and as part of our obligation to serve and our tariff with the state, which is our requirement, you know, we provide gas service to customers that are looking to connect to the gas system. Um, going back to the second question, I'm sorry, re remind me again the second question. The second question was why not focus on reducing the size of your stadium using your stadium analogy rather than right. building additional additional executes. And then there was a third question. Thank you. I, I, again, you know, I go back to there is continued customer demand and requests for natural gas service. And as such, as part of our process, our commitment to serve to ensure reliable service to our customers, you know, this project is necessary to continue to support uh, those those gas connections. Last question was, um, what is the useful life of the the vapors? The vaporizers? Right. Yeah, the useful yeah the useful life of the vaporizers. Um, I, you know, I can't give you an exact answer on that, um, but you know, it, it, again, it comes back to to maintenance and inspection and proper care of these assets. I mean, so we had we've had assets in service for you know thirty years at this plant, uh, so we can reasonably expect that with this new equipment that we install, um, you know, with proper maintenance and inspection. And, and running the system properly that that we could expect the similar uh, type tenure for, for these assets. National Grid is building infrastructure that's going to last another 30 years, even though they claim to want be making a good faith effort to reduce the demand for, 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 for gas. It doesn't make sense. Why are you building infrastructure that has a useful life of 30 years if you're trying to get rid of natural natural gas from being used at all whatsoever <laughs> within well, so within if you look at some country. of the if if you look at again some of the what Don spoke to and some of the timeline here that we're operating with under that fits into the transition to to no carbon you know net zero um and and also it's important that again you know one of the key aspects here we're modernizing the plants with the installation of these new vaporizers now this is two of of you know the, the 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 total we have six vaporizers in place today, you know we would retire older vaporizers before these ones. So when that demand curve starts to come down in the future, you know we would look to retire some of the older assets that we have at the plant, but we know we have these newer assets in service that can provide that continued need, even if that need is less than what it is today, which we expect it will be. Would this community want? natural gas to be you know the the i guess prevailing energy source for longer than our other communities it it, it still seems like a, a very short-sighted kind of approach can you explain that a little further well again what we see in our forecasting and the new requests for gas hookups and the increased you know usage that we have from some customers that want to convert from oil to gas we still see a need to provide an affordable source uh, energy solution. You know, this services all of our downstate New York service territory. It's not just the community of Brooklyn, uh, but this service this helps the service and provide reliable support to all of our customers. All right. Um, so yeah, William William Vega. You, uh, Thank you. Know. Thank you. Um, I personally find it very hard to see National Grid as a good neighbor. Uh, many, many months ago, uh, National Grid decided because there wasn't enough gas to put a moratorium and a lot of restaurants ended up closing their doors before they even opened. And it wasn't until the governor said that he was gonna take away your license as a utility company in the state, then overnight there was gas. So I explained to me that that scenario. I, always, I felt that National Grid was playing chicken with the governor. Uh, and um, apparently we did have gas because there was no problem to turn on. So I personally know about 11 uh, restaurants that never were able to open because they waited so many, many months. Thank you. I, I, I don't know if my colleagues have any insights on that. I, I don't have the, the insights on that to be able to answer that question. I'm sorry. I just don't have the details on specific 11 restaurants and who, who weren't able to connect or not. Well, I'll follow up. I mean, can you speak to the moratorium and this idea that there that you needed uh, you didn't have enough demand to meet, you know, what people are asking for and how the governor uh, threatened to revoke your license to operate in the state. 
that's the question. It's not about the 11 businesses. It's about a uh, moratorium that you set in place. So if we go back to that point in time where we were pursuing uh, another project to support the continued reliable service to our customers, we felt that the uh, where we got to was a roadblock and that you know the, the projects that we were pursuing at the time didn't have a path forward. Um, our analysis suggested at the time that we needed to issue a moratorium to protect the reliability of our existing customers that are connected to the system. Um, and, and, and as we were challenged on that, right, and then, you know, we, 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 you know, took an opportunity to review further, right, the forecast, the demand, and, and we looked for other projects that we could identify, right, that would help provide continuous reliable service and support the continued demand from our customers. Okay, any other um, committee members or board members have questions? Okay. Yes, I do. Oh, okay, Laura. Um, I, have to, I have to say I was kind of stunned with the video before because that sunshine lollipop type of scenario didn't sit right with me. I've lived in the community all my life. And as, as long as I, as long as I'm aware, um, National Grid has never been a good neighbor. And any time, any time um, we've ever been told that um, we wouldn't have extra truck in it, and that it would be completely safe. Um, it wasn't true. So convince me. Convince me. What enforceable documents do you have to show us that says, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that there won't be additional trucking, that we will be safe? Convince Dan, me. Dan Grossman, can you uh, mute, mute your microphone, please? Oh, sorry about that. I, I think again, you know, my response to your question is we've been providing safe, reliable service for many, many years. And we'll continue to do so. That is our commitment. As, as your gas utility, as your energy provider. And the work that we do is hugely important and centered around safety. And we are a regulated utility. I'll remind that we do have external uh, public service in inspectors that come in and audit us frequently. So we do have checks and balances in place to ensure that we're identifying assets, that we're constructing assets and operating assets with, with safety in mind. I, I also asked what enforceable documents does National Grid have to show the, 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 com the community that we would be safe, that there would be no expansion, that um, the gas wouldn't be uh, trucked out on the streets, that you that the that the expansion for the truck the trucking area um, is even needed. I, I, so I have to go back. There, there, there is no trucking involved as part of our current plan. I, I made that statement earlier. My right. understanding, though, from before was that that even even though you claim that there wouldn't be any trucking, that that you were modernizing with something the, with the trucking area. So why would that be necessary at all? Well, again, it's a supply resiliency and contingency. So as a utility, we have to be prepared for the unavailable, you know, uh, circumstances of, of weather scenarios, upstream energy service scenarios where we can't get the supply to our system. Um, and, and it's purely a backup and it's, it, it's part of our long term plan. We need to plan for that. We have that in our public filings with the state and, and important that we continue to do that to ensure safe, reliable service. So, so all this information is presented as part of our rate case proceedings, and they're all available as public documents and how we explain and justify these projects. Steve, you're muted. Thank you, Willis. Any, uh, any other questions from board members? Okay, um, then uh, let's move on to the general public. Sorry, Steve, and... if I may. Pardon? Sorry, if I may. Who is that? Oh, sorry. Dan Grossman. Oh, okay, sorry, Dan, go ahead. I was just wondering if um, 
Chris or whoever, could, if you could briefly summarize some of the alternatives you considered um, to solve this problem of potentially um, you know, too much demand at peak times and why you didn't uh, choose maybe any of those? It, it, that's, a, that's a great question, Dan. So certainly coupled with the infrastructure projects that we have, Vaporizer 13 and 14, you know, I'll highlight, and I don't know that many are aware of this, we have the largest demand response program out of any gas utility in the country. So we've invested over the years uh, a lot of time and effort uh, to make sure that we can balance the needs of our customers with the demand on our system. Uh, and, and that's an important fact, right? And, and that's work that we're going to continue. We're going to continue to expand DR. We're going to continue to expand energy efficiency. Uh, but it's not going to do it alone right now. This, this does need to be coupled with targeted infrastructure investments, modernization on our system to be able to get to the future that we all want to, that we all aspire to and want to be there. Steve, you're muted again. <laughs> Hey, type, typing and trying to talk at the same time. Sorry. Thanks, Willis. Um, yeah, so just, uh, yeah, just with quick with the ground rules. Yeah, if you <clears throat> let's keep things succinct, laser focus with your questions and, um, you yeah, try and, you know, keep a minute in mind if possible. Um, and uh, keep it civil. And if you could, yeah, raise your hand in using the uh, reaction button on desktop, laptop, and the more button um, on your phone, and then lower it when you're you're done. So, uh, with that said, um, well, so have you been kind of watching or? Sure. Yeah, okay, I can uh, help call people. So okay. I'm just going to call people who have their hands part raised. Part of the district, actually, and Gates, who has. Repeatedly done Donald Trump's bidding and pushed the big lie yeah. over and over, saying mean? the GOP is 100% of the party of Trump. This is Donald Trump's party, and I'm a Donald Trump Republican. Oh. oh, okay. Uh, hi. Um, I just wondered about you, like. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Can oh, I got. Can you, Marie, can you mute? We need that? you to mute. Barbara, Barbara, can you mute your microphone? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I I had to come. Okay. Okay. So, we're, I'm going to go through the list as they appear on my screen here with people have their hands raised. So first up is Catherine Thompson. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Um, hello. I got you, Catherine. I can hear you. I hear you. Um. Uh, let's see. You, can, you can't hear me. I'm on my phone. We, we can, can hear you. Please we speak. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> um. Yeah. So, um. Uh. My name is Catherine Thompson, and I'm I'm participating in the uh, rate case that is uh currently going on, and. Reading through it, we're, I'm wondering what is the difference between the LNG truck load unload station project and the portable LNG trucking project that were both proposed in the rate case? Does the company anticipate going forward with both of these projects? Any movement on a MOU with the mayor's office to truck LNG through our streets? I know you said there's no plan, but it is indicated in the uh, joint proposal that has just been published. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can pick up some of that and maybe one of my colleagues, Pete, can jump in with some of the details. But first off, let me make sure this is really clear. There is no portable LNG project. So you, you, I don't know what you're referring to, maybe portable CNG that we've since removed from scope and we're not pursuing. And that was uh, clarified and, and stated to as part of the DEC hearings. The, the truck unload station, the LNG truck unload station was what we were just describing earlier, where it's a project that replaces an existing truck load unload station at the facility that we've had it uh, that was constructed when the plant was, was commissioned in service back in the 60s. Uh, the new project will replace the existing asset and will pro provide for emergency contingency operations only 
And that will only happen in the event that we secure approval with the city to truck LNG, and we do not have that. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. It's just um, when we when I was reading through it, it there is some sort of um, reference to the portable LNG um, as and needing financing through the rate case. So I just want to confirm that you're saying there is absolutely no portable LNG, and that you're saying that it's not um, a part of the rate case line items and such. That there is no portable LNG project in the New York City uh, Kedney business. So I'm not sure what reference you're making. I, I apologies, I don't have the joint proposal in front of me, but um, I'm not clear on that reference that you're referring to. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I would just second that, Chris. There is no plan for portable LNG at the Greenpoint property. And the portable CNG that was initially discussed uh, as an option, if we were not able to get the vaporizer project in place, we have removed that from our scope. And because we were able to determine that the vaporizers could be secured within the acceptable time frame. Okay. Um, next up is Kevin Lachera. Hey y'all. Um, okay, yeah. I guess just I have a question. Just a uh, just a few brief things based on what the gentleman uh, Chris Connolly had said. Um, you know, I, I so I'm I'm a fourth generation Green Pointer, uh, which means that my family's been here just about as long as National Grid has been in the neighborhood. Um, and you know, and it's precursor Brooklyn Union Gas. Um, you talked a little bit about safe and reliable service for many many years. Um, what that actually looks like um, is that you guys are a potentially responsible party for one of the largest oil spills in North America. Um, you know, uh, you sit on some of the most polluted land in North America, um, and you are responsible for the climate crisis, you know, amongst many other companies and individuals. Uh, but like, that's, <laughs> that's, that's what we're talking about. Um, and, you know, I think that what we're hearing, what, you know, Laura is exactly right and has been doing this long enough to know, um, you know, the sunshine and lollipops, the corporate speak um, is because this is a corporation and it's a corporation operating for profit, you know, not for the public. And ultimately the answer here is public power. Um, but I think that you guys are not going to be a, a cooperative friend uh, to the community in that transition. And because, you know, you were forced to come here today, at, you know, after so 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 long, you were forced to come to the community board in January 29, January 2020. Um, you know, you've not been a partner to this community, and we all know that. Um, so it's like let's let's call this what it is. Um, you know, let's talk about the future energy efficiency. You've been coming to the community for the last decade, saying you're going to do methane capture on Newtown Creek. You know, and these little half steps, half steps, half steps. Um, you know, we're all going to drown in the meantime. So, you know, I just, it's, it's hard because the actual nuts and bolts, the actual on paper of what you have done in this community is, mm -hmm. is the longest rap sheet, you know, any of us <laughs> have ever seen. So it's just, you know, for you to come here and say, oh, these vaporizers are going to be fine. Don't worry, Cooper Park houses. Don't worry the neighborhood. Don't worry about the trucks. It's just, it is, you know, our neighborhood has the experience. Um, and has faced the consequences of what you're trying to do, and we're not going to allow you to do it. Um, the area of the Greenpoint facility is a DEC designated potential environmental justice area, which requires you to conduct additional community outreach when you propose a project here. Um, you didn't conduct that additional outreach. This is the first time that we have heard from you about this. Um, you know, and it seems like you've actively tried to evade any public scrutiny of those vaporizers, of the project itself. Um, no residents or community stakeholders were made aware of the project or involved in the decision-making process. So, you know, why, I guess, you know, if I have a question, uh, why? You know, why? If you are this wonderful community partner that has nothing to hide and can stand on your record and you're not afraid of it and all this other stuff, 
Why hasn't there been that active outreach and collaboration? Why hasn't why why is it that every elected official in this community opposes what you guys are trying to do, and you're full steam ahead, trying to drive us all off a cliff? Like you know why? Like where was that community outreach, and and where do you see it going from here? So Kevin, well, I can't speak to the to the history, right? I can tell you that we're here tonight, and our hand wasn't forced in in being here tonight, right? We're here to engage. To inform, to make sure that we have the facts out there, to listen, certainly, right? And we have been listening. I attended all four of the DEC public hearings. I recall you uh, making statement in, in the DEC public hearing. Um, it, it's so we're, we're listening and we're here and we're, and we're engaging with you. We're going to continue to do that going forward. You know that was part of the opening with Brian's <laughs> commitments, and you know certainly we're gonna we're gonna continue to do this uh, with the community going forward. Do you think that the history of what your company has done to this community is relevant to the future of what your company is trying to do to this community? Do you think that so, that's relevant? I think that National Grid has ever had a very balanced response to working with the community. What we did over the last year and a half with the COVID response, investing it, continue to invest in our community. So I, I would say that we are doing our part within the community and we'll continue to do so. As I and I'm sorry, you know, to Steve, I guess, but it's, you know, and to the board. As someone who has been deeply involved every single day in that COVID response in this community, in delivering food to our elders and you know helping people get housing and do all these sorts of things, what you guys did was, was ran your workers through this community without wearing masks to force the pipeline through while the rest of us were trying to care for each other. It's insulting and it's disgusting that you would say something like that. It's, abs it's, it's, it's just, it is so absurd. You know, it, it is an insult to every single person here that you would say that you've been a partner through COVID. What does that even mean? Like, I just, it, you know, it, it's the, the, the long term picture of this community does not have you in it, period, full stop. Like, the days are numbered. And I just think that it's like it is on full display here that like you don't care at all to say you don't you know to, the, the, you can't speak to the history of what your company has done if somebody comes and burns my house down and then they come and burn my house down again and then they come and burn my house down again and again and again for a hundred years and then they come and they say we have a video presentation for you you know <laughs> what would you do what would you do you let I, mean, that I think we've addressed the question, and I think we're quite out of scope from why we're here yeah, tonight. We're out, of, we're out of scope. You guys are real balanced. It's just, it is, it's an insult and it's absurd. And this community is just not going to stand for it. And ultimately, you know, when you talk about your regulated utility, um, I don't think for much longer. All right, Kevin, hey, Kevin, man, we hear you yeah. loud and clear. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Totally. Thank you. Um, I, Steve, can I just ask one, one pointed follow up mm -hmm. to one thing that, that Kevin mentioned? Is that earlier in this presentation and an email that was sent to the community board, you specifically mentioned reaching out to stakeholder groups. I'm the executive director of a local stakeholder environmental group. There's many on this call tonight. We have not been personally contacted to have a meeting about what's happening at the LNG facility. I'm wondering if you can provide a list of who you've specifically reached out to in the community to have those conversations. What organization are you with? Newtown Creek Alliance. I will check the list. We'll get back to Steve tomorrow. Okay. Next up in the queue is JK. Um, thank you for coming to answer these questions. And uh, I was at a DEC hearing where the representative from National Grid said this. He said the MRI, which the rest of New York calls the North Brooklyn pipeline uh, is independent of the facility, but in the rate case, your own documents say that they would physically connect and that the phase five of the pipeline would allow more gas to come in and out of the LNG facility. So why did the rep directly contradict what was published by National Grid's own rate case documents? Can you clarify that for me? Because I'm quite confused. So I'm going to turn to my colleague Pete to, to help answer that. Sure, Chris, I'd be happy to. So the MRI phase five project 
is intended to improve the reliability and resiliency of the gas system going to and from the existing Greenpoint facility. It does not connect to any upstream supply sources. It does not add any additional gas supplies to the system. It is there to be able to facilitate moving the gas in and out of that facility through a second pathway as opposed to the existing setup, which has only a single pathway in and out of the plant. But I wasn't asking about upstream or anything like that. I was asking about that exact connection that you just outlined for us. The connection between the MRI, North Brooklyn Pipeline, and the LNG facility, that they were independent of each other. Are you saying that the North Brooklyn MRI, whatever you want to call it, pipeline would run anyway without the LNG facility, but the LNG facility would not run without the pipeline? No. All right. I am saying that if the vaporizers are built in Greenpoint and the MRI phase five project is not built, then the Greenpoint vaporizers will operate without it and the operation will be less efficient. If the MRI phase five project is built and the Greenpoint vaporizers are not built, then the system will be more efficient and we won't be able to pull the gas out through that additional exit that Chris referenced earlier. So what's your fallback then? The the dream of trucking it in and out? I'm not sure how you would. Trucking in and out has nothing to do with any of, of what we are discussing right now. Because okay. we we don't need to we don't need to truck anything in or out of Greenpoint in order to do anything regarding either of the two projects that you're referencing right now. Okay, because the whole thing seemed to me, if you forgive a phrase, it seemed a sure. bit misleading. Thank you. I, I hope I clarified it for you. If not, I'll be happy to try again. No, well, let's move on. I got what I needed. Thank you. Okay. Okay, um, Margo, you're next. Um, hi. So I'm wondering, I actually I have two parts because as I'm listening, another thing occurred to me. So I'm going to ask you this first. So I'm wondering if the city's supportive of your plans, why didn't they sign on to the joint proposal that you just filed in the rate case? Um, and then I have a vaporizer question. Do you want to answer that first or should I just go on to my other question? Sure. Just to address the rate case, I mean, that process is still happening as we speak. And we expect the joint proposal to come to agreement here later this summer. Right, but the joint proposal, which was filed, has um, the parties who oppose it and the parties who approved it, and the city has opposed the joint proposal. So I don't, I can't really see that as being supportive of all of the plans that you've um, mm -hmm. shown us this evening, because I mean, this is all about the rate case and what you're. Yeah. About so. To help. I, I, unfortunately, I can't speak for the city and their position on this. I can, you know, I can only tell you that the process is still ongoing and we expect to get a resolution at, at the end of the summer. Um, okay, it just seems like by not signing, signing on to the joint proposal, that's not a very supportive position of any of the things that you've laid out for us so far tonight. So, all right, on to the vaporizers. Can you um, tell us the current status of the two LNG vaporizers, number 13 and 14? and how likely you think that it is that you're going to pursue them, and then how much are they going to cost rate payers with the new, um, the, the new proposed surcharge mechanism that's in the rate case, the, the um, demand capacity surcharge mechanism? Well, I, I'll give you an answer on the, the project and the status, and then you'll have to ask me again the second part of the question with the surcharge. So the, the project currently is going through the permitting phase, uh, we are continuing to follow the process with DEC, and we don't have a resolution on that process yet to secure the air permit that I spoke about earlier. Uh, we have ordered long lead equipment and materials uh, in anticipation that we will receive the permit and we will be able to construct the project. That's important in order to meet the timeline that we have because we need, we're looking to have that project in service to support future winter needs, again, based on the forecasted growth that we see in our system to maintain reliable operations for our customers. When do you hope to have them online? So we, we, we are planning to have uh, vaporizer 1314, our current plan, 
as Vaporizer 1314 online for winter 22-23. So by December of 2022, and, and that's based on what we know now with the current process with the DEC timeline to secure the permit. Okay, and how much is this going to cost rate payers under the surcharge mechanism? I, I'm sorry, I don't have the details on that as part of the surcharge mechanism um, on the costs. Okay, thanks. Could could we ask National Grid to follow up and provide that answer? Because all this is going to go into a written report for the full community board. It would be really nice to have answers to these questions that are being asked that aren't being answered right now. Well, I, I believe that information again is in publicly available documents uh, that we have filed with the rate case. Okay. Well, instead of asking us to go through a very lengthy and technical document, you should be able to provide the answers to us in a very clear fashion so that we can understand it as community members. So we, we can follow up with the, with the committee. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Next up is Kim. Thanks, Willis. Um, hi, everybody. Um, you know, so you're you're building these additional vaporizers. Um, you know, you've only used one percent of um, your capacity in 2019 and, and 12 percent of your capacity in 2020, and now you want to build even more. Um, so, how would um, you know? How would vaporizers? I have a question about these vaporizers. How would they be refilled and um, you know, you've written that LNG trucks would be used to refill the vaporizers since you're not allowed to store any additional LNG on the site. Um, so how would this refilling process work? Um, and where would these LNG trucks come from? Um, what route would they drive? And when would they leave filled? And what is their destination and route? Um, I know that you said that trucking is not a part of this, but you have applied for a variance in our in our um, city law um, that outlaws LNG on New York City streets, and you've asked, um, you know, the FDNY, and you've asked the city of New York to allow you to have a variance um, and and make a loophole for your company in our law that protects our health and safety to um, to to use trucks at this facility. So I'm just curious, you know, like. Uh, like, what are your, what, how do they get refilled? Just to reiterate my question. Um, and, you know, how does this refilling process work? And um, since you do have plans for trucking, like, what does that route look like? Thank you. Kim, thank you um, for repeating the questions. So, uh, the refilling process does not involve trucking. There will be zero trucking involved with the vaporizers and with the operations at Greenpoint. Okay. What I explained earlier in the presentation is that we take gas from our system during the summer months and we liquefy that gas and we store it in the two tanks that we have at Greenpoint. Then during the winter heating season, we reach into those tanks as the reserves and the additional supply to be able to supplement the, the, the supply that comes in onto our system to be able to support our customers only on the coldest days of the winter. These vaporizers are op operated very infrequently. You asked a question at the start about the percentage of, you know, what we've used at Greenpoint. We're coming out of two winters that were milder than normal. That may be a short-term trend, but we still have to plan for what would be our design day conditions. And that's something that we do plan for, and that's something that we're required to plan for and forecast. And that's why the supply is necessary out of Greenpoint in order to enable you know, reliable service to all of our customers during those coldest days of the year. Would you characterize your system then as pipelines that are connected to the LNG facility, like um, the MRI pipeline that you're um, planning, that you're building against the will of the community? Yeah, we, we operate a natural gas distribution system as we've had pipeline. for, for those over are pipeline. 100 years. Right, mm -hmm. okay, so you're, the, the MRI pipeline would be directly connected to the, um, the LNG facility. The, the MRI pipe is part of our distribution system. Correct. So that would make that part of connecting directly to the LNG facility, which you said was an independent project. So you could avoid doing, you know, cumulative environmental 
impact. And I'll restate, it, you know, it's, 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 I'm sorry to interrupt, but MRI is not a pipeline. It's part of our local gas distribution system. <laughs> Well, because I live here, right? And you're building it two blocks from my house. So are you telling me that a 30 inch steel um, circular tube is not a pipeline that has been being installed by workers? I, I, think, there's my a, I think there's a, a misunderstanding that somehow that that is an interstate pipeline running through. No, the we know that it's not it an interstate not. pipeline because we had to work very hard to get the maps from you. We know it's not an interstate pipeline. We're not stupid. Please don't, please don't no, well, think that it's interstate. Thank you. No, well, I'm just saying, and the maps were made publicly available on a website, so. After we had to beg you for them. I so think anyway, question, than that, but... you're saying that this MRI project is, is not a pipeline. So what are all of us from the community seeing built our street, uh, you know, people have actually uh, done civil disobedience to halt the construction of this uh, pipeline. And you're saying that it's not a pipeline. Why, why would what you you're seeing, Kim, I, uh, you know, you've asked the question several times now and we can continue to debate and respectfully, you know, you, you have your opinion in view. Uh, what we've done is we've invested to modernize our infrastructure to support reliable operations. Why are That's you saying that, that it's not a pipeline? Why are you saying that it's not a pipeline? I, I don't know that it, it, we need to differentiate between pipeline, non-pipeline. It's part of our distribution system, and that's the vernacular that we use in National Grid. So everybody here at this systems. meeting, that's part of the community, that's seeing a giant steel tubes throughout our streets. You're telling us that we are providing misinformation by calling it a pipeline. You, you, you said earlier that we are uh, um, being misleading, but I mean, if you refused in front of everybody here to say that it's a pipeline, there's something odd about that. And you did just say that it directly connects to the LNG facility, because that's, you. if you don't want to use the um, word pipeline. How is directly connecting to, how does directly connecting to the Greenpoint facility make it a pipeline in your mind? Can you repeat that, please? Okay, can I, can I just inter interject here? Point, so, what is, the, the distribution system is a system. So, what yes. is the physical apparatus that, you know, that moves the gas from point A to point B? What do you, I mean, is it, if it's not a pipeline, then is we it a conduit? We refer to our system as consisting of gas mains. Of what, I'm sorry? Gas uh, mains. Gas we refer to our distribution system as gas mains. Mm -hmm. And that's what well, distinguish it from the pipeline infrastructure that comes to New York City. And that is what we do within our industry, within our company. That's our vernacular, as okay. Chris alluded to. Right, but no, nobody ever here said that this pipeline was an interstate pipeline. We know that you were really pushing for an interstate pipeline called the Williams Pipeline, and you that's why you uh, created the moratorium, because you lied about the gas capacity, because we proved that with several reports. Um, so we know that you were building the, the, the North Brooklyn Pipeline as an anticipation of this um, you know, uh, interstate pipeline, and we know that we uh, defeated that in 2018, 19, and 2020 uh, with both New Jersey and New York State. But you continued then to build the intrastate pipeline, the North Brooklyn pipeline. So, are you telling me that 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 I'm still wrong? That that's not a pipeline? Yes, and that because that is a reliability and resiliency project that does not add supply to the system. So if you're saying that MRI was built as part of an interstate pipeline system, and you're saying that the pipe was adding supply to the system, it is not. It is a resiliency and reliability project that connects two points on our distribution system. Correct. We know that. Mr. Connolly, I just posted the um, the definition from Miriam Webster, the definition of a pipeline. Oh, for you. Jesus Christ. Give me a break. All right, hey, folks, I think we're, we're going to kind yeah, of stuck in a five mile on you. this. But, Thank you yeah. for underestimating my intelligence. So, um, Wills, is anyone else? Yes, uh, we have 
three more speakers with their hands raised. Uh, Ruhan is next. Okay, okay well, so let's, let's make these the final three so then we can move on to uh, the rest of the meeting. So, um, okay. Okay, Ruhan. Thanks, Willis. Um, so I, I have two questions. The first is um, in your presentation, uh, you you talked about how vaporizers 13 and 14 were part of your long term capacity report and therefore fully vetted by the public and you know interrogated in public meetings, um, which, which is quite a misrepresentation. So I just wanted to give you a chance to respond. Um, so in in February 2020, you issued a, a long term capacity report with uh, with several options: large scale infrastructure, distributed infrastructure, and no infrastructure options. Vaporizers 13 and 14 were not in that report. That was your February 2020 report. The vaporizers 13 and 14 were nowhere to be found. Um, then in May 2020, you issued a supplemental report in which you talked about vaporizers 13 and 14 for the very first time, and there were no public meetings after the issuance of that supplemental report. Therefore, vaporizers 13 and 14 were never vetted by the public. So, so how can you possibly say that, the, um, that vaporizers 13 and 14 underwent uh, a, a public debate and, and, and public scrutiny when you actually, it seems, intentionally omitted them from your, from your first original report after which public meetings followed? That's my first question. My second question is, um, you know, in, in response to Kim's question about the refilling process and LNG trucking, you insisted that LNG trucking is not part um, of, has nothing to do with the vaporizers. However, I'm, I'm just going to quote directly from uh, page 53 of your May 2020 long term su supp that supplemental report. It says right here, and I quote, Additionally, since the added vaporization capacity occurs without an increase in storage capacity, LNG truck station permits and an LNG trucking memorandum of understanding with the city of New York are required to enable a refill process. Required to enable a refill process. That's that's a quote from page 53 of your report. So are you saying that you know that you're, that's publicly available on your website? Are you saying it's wrong? Are you disavowing it here today? What's going on with that? Uh, so I'm going to pick up the first part of the question uh, where the public input process. So that's part of what tonight is. That's part of what the DEC process has been, right? Since we filed our permit application, we had the open comment period at the end of last calendar year. We had the four DEC public hearings. That's been all part of the DEC process, right? And, and getting this project out into the view of the community to get feedback and input. From the community. On the second question, you know, you record on page 53, and apologies, I, I, I don't have that in front of me. But again, I'll, I'll refer to, you know, what we're trying to accomplish with this project, right? This is about supporting the needs of our customers. This is about supporting the forecasted growth that we see on our system. All right, um, who's next? Thank you, Ron. Who else is next? Um, Barb is next. Hi, thank you for coming here today. Um, let's see, my question is, so you're, one of your first speakers claimed that national gas is clean, but it produces methanes. And so how can you call it clean when it does a huge horrible gas that contains so much carbon dioxide that it's more than like a bunch of cars. Can you explain that, why it's still considered clean? So I think I'm gonna to refer to my colleague, Don. Maybe, Don, can you pick that up, please? I don't know if you're trying to get off mute. Yeah, I did. Um, I don't remember making that statement. Let me just say that, you know, um, Power that common was you know pulled out of his presentation. When you look at all of the fossil fuels, methane has the lowest carbon intensity. You may have said I may have said RNG, renewable natural gas, is clean or hydrogen. I do want to make a distinction that if you're talking about renewable natural gas from biomass feedstocks, that is methane that is derived from biogenic sources. Its combustion does not lead to increase of CO2 concentration to the atmosphere. In other words, if you combust renewable natural gas from biogenic feedstocks, you are recycling the CO2 in the, at in the atmosphere. The distinction is if you use geological natural gas or natural gas, 
you are increasing the CO2 emissions in the atmosphere. I don't know if you heard me say something around renewable natural gas or hydrogen and how it reduces emissions. No, I just heard I just heard you say that, you know, it's the one of those things that always is out there that natural gas is so clean, blah, 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 blah. And it's just not true. That's what I believe. And you said kind of uh, are agreeing with me, I guess. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's 2021. It's kind of insane that we're talking about natural gas like it's not well documented of the impacts of methane release, especially from fracking onto climate change in the atmosphere. So I, I don't really <laughs> understand that response to what should be a very obvious question and statement personally. Um, but I'll go on. So last speaker we have with our hands raised is Sophie. Hi, um, so my question is, does Na National Grid do any testing for radon at the LNG facility? Uh, sorry, that was testing for radon at the LNG facility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I can't answer that question. I'm sorry, I don't have the answer to that question. And can we also ask that you an answer as a follow up? We can so Steve, that and follow up. Right, Steve. Can right. can we do? Steve, this is Renee. Yes. Can can we any questions? Any follow-up questions that are being asked, can we ask that they be put in the chat? And then I would also say that we'll follow up with the list of um, individuals that we reached out to, many who are on this call to this evening, where we sent the letters. We really encourage you to respond to the letter and set up a meeting with us so we can go into more details to ensure all the information that we're sharing today and any additional questions you may have are addressed. Steve, can I? If you want to meet with us, we're happy to do it. I mean, it's not, it's, I'm not trying to get FaceTime. I mean, we have channels of talking to National Grid. It's about people like Cooper Park houses that live a block away who were completely uninformed of this entire process until folks like me and Kim and Lee reached out and said, hey, by the way, you know, the toxic site that you live a, a block away from, well, they want to be increasing their out, output capacity capabilities and reliability options or however you want to phrase it. And they haven't done any outreach. And it was asked in terms of, you know, regards to environmental justice communities. There's so many folks that are living and working right there who have no idea what is what is happening currently and what these plans entail. So it's not, don't worry about Newtown Creek Alliance. We're very well informed about what's going on. It's about all of the groups who aren't represented even at this call tonight. They need to be reached out to on a regular basis. So I just want to say that. And then Steve, if you will indulge me, I know we want to move on, but I just want National Grid representatives here tonight. If you can respond to, you mentioned earlier, when you get the DEC permits and approvals to move forward with this, what, what realistically, how do you think DEC is going to respond? We had four different days of public hearings and over thousands of comments submitted by this community. And in my impression, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, is that 100% every single person who spoke on the public session was completely opposed to this plan. So how do you expect DEC to completely ignore that community feedback? So I can't speak for DEC, Willis. Uh, like I said earlier, we're, we're following the process and you know, we're, we're you know, trusting that we'll get to an outcome that will look at the merits of the project and how we're supporting our 1.9 million customers across our service territory. So Steve, I wanna thank you again. And again, to Willis, if you know organizations that we should be reaching out that you feel that we have not, please uh, let us know and we will do that as well. We are here to uh, talk about you know, the questions or address any questions you might have. And if you think we've missed some groups, we are we're here to identify work with you to identify who they are, and then we will follow up accordingly. So thank you. All right. Uh, thank thank you, Renee, and thank you, everyone, Chris, Peter, Don, you, um, the whole the whole team. Um, I know this was a really passionate discussion, but I think you know um, I just feel like the community is doing due diligence. You know, it's just. Um, 
you know, on a couple fronts. You know, it's a safety issue. I think it's just a natural inclination for everyone to look out for one another um, with, you know, just with natural gas and liquid natural gas, all the potential ways that, you know, there are, there are gaps in the system. And then there's the climate issue. You know, it's just the, you know, the, um, you know, the coronavirus, the, you know, the pandemic the last year, uh, it kind of um, causes, you know, look the other way, but the climate emergency is, you know, is in full, full tilt. And, you know, there's, there's been something we've been talking about recently in relation to some battery storage uh, units on a building that came through and they cited, you know, an accident, uh, you know, years back where these battery units um, essentially they uh, experience thermal runaway or essentially, you know, there's a, a degradation in the, the chemical makeup of the battery and it sets up a chain reaction where there's a fire, et cetera. And so I feel like it's a good analogy for the planet. I feel like our, our, our planet's climate is in, like, in a runaway. And so I feel like we're just, I feel like the community and our board members are just doing due diligence, you know, to apply pressure. And it seems like, you know, intense pressure to, you know, to, you know, in real terms, get to, to net zero. And so, um, and, you know, I said, you know, there's a very passionate discussion. You know, there's been a very, it's been a very passionate discussion from day one when the solar chain was daylighted. But I feel like, you know, um, you know, the organizations that are, are being represented tonight, they're, they're just looking after our neighbors and our, um, our inhabitants. And so I uh, hope you'll, you know, you take, you're, you're hearing that, you know, that's, that's really what's at stake here. And so, you know, they're, I think they're doing, they're doing their job and our board's doing the job to look out for 160,000 um, residents of our district. So. We appreciate the audience. Appreciate you listening. Look, we're only going to get to a solution here through dialogue. So let's sit down. Let's have a conversation. Let's figure out a way to, that we can meet the needs of all of our customers um, and work with you, you all. Happy to do it. All right. Well, we're going to hold you Great. to that. So, all right. Well, thanks again, Renee and uh, your team. And, um, and thanks everyone from the community who uh, came out and spoke and um, attended. And so now we're, we're going to move further, uh, further onto our agenda. Um, our committee is just going to just discuss um, the presentation, the discussion. Thanks, Steve. All right, thank you, Chris. Um, thank you. And if you know we, you know, if have any afterthoughts, and if we, you know, if there's people have a resolution in mind, or you know, do any members have any thoughts about that? I mean, I just want to add, you know, it, it, you know, uh, over a year ago, through our committee, the board issued, you know, a, a resolution, number one, uh, opposing the MRI project and, um, you know, upgrading the LNG terminal. But do we want to, but that was, you know, before we do, dove into the details more deeply on that project. So, um, so what do folks think? Um, I have, you know, I've taken extensive notes, so I, you know, I will compile that and uh, present it at the, you know, the June uh, full board meeting. Was there anything we can do short of write another letter that said, said what the letter before said? I mean, is, um, what, what's within our power to actually have impact any change? Well, I think at the very least, if we, you know, we issued, um, recommended the board that we issue, you know, a letter or some uh, communication. It's just, it's an expression of this board on behalf of the district, you know, so at the very least, you know, we go on record with either, you know, with National Grid, the commission, governor. And we can acknowledge our previous letter that said, yeah. said the same thing. Yeah. Or again, I, I know, are we, you know, said we will express what was uh, was put out here in my in my report. So I appreciate that, Steve. I mean, I I you know, to I would just say for me, this whole process is, you know, there's still National Grid people on the line, and this is being recorded. But I, you know, this whole thing is is kind of frustrating. 
you know, frankly, you know, they are a massive occupant of, of an area of CB1 and have had dramatic impact on this community for many years. And I feel like if they were really serious about what they're claiming to be serious about and providing benefit and working towards, you know, clean energy, we'd be having real conversations about what is happening at the facility, not just in terms of their, and I will use the word expansion because that's what it is, expansion of fossil fuel infrastructure, but also what they're doing to right the sins of the past and clean up the site. I mean, those tanks were demolished in 2001 and they're, they're just empty toxic brownfields that are not producing any valuable use for the ecology or the neighborhood. You know, when are we going to get to actually planning as to how we're going to utilize this 120 acre facility for the benefit of the community and not just being the LNG facility for all of New York, downstate New York or whatever it is. So, you know, I would welcome National Grid to be more transparent and come and come and have regular conversations with us. Um, but frankly, they, they need to be a little bit more like, you know, they need to own up to what's happening there and their impacts on the community. So if there's some way to work that into the letter, you know, I would support that. That's not to mention all the lead contamination that they caused and, and effects from that. All of it. I mean, it's just like it's it's massive, and the fact that it's like the site just exists as you know something like they should be coming and talking to us on a regular basis, anyways, just because of the the, the sheer size of it. And um, so, yeah, thanks, Laura, for that. Can I just say a couple of things? I mean, they were talking about terminology. This is not a public utility; it's a corporate utility, and their history has always been bad neighbors. So that image that they're going to be good neighbors to us, that's a lie that's been, as Kevin said, too many decades. So I, I just, it's just the history is they've always been a bad neighbor. They don't really care about community and it's a corporate utility. It's not public. It should be public. Then all of us would have voices. Thank you. All right. Um, well, should we want to want to want to issue a letter um, to to whom? To to just you know various parties: the governor, chair of the PSC, um, the mayor, just and 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 a national grid, just expressing the key points key points that uh, people are, are talking about right now. Hi, Steve. This is DEC and DEP. Um, Kim just put a couple of um, good points into the chat. I don't know if we can only write one letter, but maybe have a specific letter to the mayor's office of sustainability and whoever else she addressed in the chat, um, Suzanne DeRoches and Ben Furnas. Okay. Thanks for grabbing that. Okay. And since the state regulated, we should add Emily and uh, Julia, our state center, our state assembly woman. Okay. All right. So essentially, the let's just say the bullet points of the letter will be um, you know, demand, basically demanding that national grid. Um, Um, re reach out to, you know, um, communities and segments in our, our district to, um, essentially we're not informed of the, of the project. For one. Yeah. I mean, I, I think one of the, I think the topic about the LNG trucking is really important that the that as they stated tonight they intend to rebuild a defunct facility and you know just something that clearly states that you know i mean i can't speak for the entire community board but that we would say the community board opposes the trucking of lng of lng through the neighborhood 
as, as is supported by current New York City law, um, just to sort of have that on the record. I mean, this is kind of insane that they that this is something that's not legal right now, and they haven't done it in many, many years, and they are looking to rebuild this this operation. To me, that's like a big takeaway from tonight. It's like that it's the next step and what what's happening here. I know it's been in the works, but you know. They discussed it on the record, so. Okay. Um, and the so previous they... letter opposed both the vaporizers and the LNG pipeline. So, right, the previous letter that the community board sent. Yeah, the MRI and the. Uh, and the... So we should re reiterate that as well. Right? Well, yeah, we could do that, um, but I feel like. You know, we were all, you know, we were like, it came up a little bit tonight, but I feel like we didn't, you know, go into so much detail about the LNG yeah. facility last time that we should really, um, let's feel, feel otherwise. Okay. Um, so it's really, we're just Having real real conversations throughout the community with all, you know, just have an equitable discussion um, with um, you know, significant segments of the of our, our district. Mention the mention that um, there's a the point about you know there this this trucking facility has been dormant all these years. And the idea of revitalizing it and upgrading it is troubling and threatening. Okay. Um, anything else? I think, I, I mean, from my standpoint, um, yeah, you hear the argument about balance between meeting demand while achieving you know, climate goals, but I know it's kind of my little soapbox. Speech at the end, I just feel like um, things are kind of happening in slow motion behind the curve, and so um, this is a question of you know these alternative pathways. I feel like there should just be so many other pathways, um, and and we didn't really delve into the you know to the, the you know the alternative substance that will flow through the. The main, uh, aka pipeline. Want to want to go there? <laughs> yeah, I, um, yeah. I mean, I just, I don't know. Sorry if this isn't helpful, but <laughs> I mean, this presentation is really. I mean, if they're gonna try and do outreach to us and other community groups and make the cases to. <laughs> what they're doing at this facility and why it's in our best interest, they got to present something more like where there, there's no numbers. Like, where's the graph of like demand and where, you know, how much, you know, gas demand there's been in the past 10 years versus what the predictions are, how many times they've been actually utilizing the vaporizers in recent years, how many day, like how many of these coldest days of the year. I mean, it's just, there, there's no real information that they presented to us. And so, I worry a little bit about, you know, if they want to go around and present to more groups, it, it, it's pointless if they're just going to show a video and talk about their commitment. And so I don't know best how to put that in a letter, but it's just my response to this whole thing tonight. Um, I just feel like this is a lot of, a lot of greenwashing. Okay. That is what I'm most interested in. Just what is the, what is the true problem here? How many people could lose power at peak demand? Well, like, what have they calculated? Um, what are the alternatives they're considering? The trade-offs? Um, just to kind of continue along with that. That's good. Okay. Perhaps. Yes, oh, sorry, perhaps. Go ahead. Perhaps. Go ahead, Laura. The Perhaps the letter could say something along the lines of, you know, we, we would like you to talk about real 
real solutions and real impacts on the community rather than than showing us greenwashing videos. Why can't we say that as a as a committee? Um, we could well, we could say that. I think maybe in a, I don't know if that needs to be in. Well, yeah, okay. We figured a way to phrase it in a nicer uh, way. No, I know what you're saying. No, I and I I, I have to agree with that. I have to I think I have to say that. Um, you know, I was with the presentation, but I feel like essentially we were showing a you know a commercial at the end um, to kind of smooth things over. And I don't know. I just I don't feel like that was the best move. I feel like. Um, you know, talk, talk about history, you know, the history of people in this community of activism decades and decades. Um, you know, it's just we're way beyond uh, too smart for that. So, um, so yeah, we can mention that. Do you think we should acknowledge the rate case that's going on? Yeah, we didn't really go there. Um, talk about it, you know. <laughs> Why should the, you know, the ratepayers pay more to support this project? But people don't. We're, we're just questioning the project in general, anyhow. So, um, but yeah, we didn't really. That wasn't really discussed. Um, so, Steve. Yeah. Hey, Eric. Hey. So, my sense from this whole presentation and just the evasiveness of some of the the comments, um, particularly to Will's questions and Kim's questions. You know, it, it feels like they're doing kind of a legal dance. They don't want to say too much on the record because also because of the rate case, but also because they're just, you know, um, they're just trying to avoid, uh, you know, legal, you know, getting themselves in trouble. So since they have, since they're a public utility, private company that's a public utility, they have to definitely, you know, report to different agencies. The, some of the statistics that the, the panel's been talking about. So when we make these asks, it has to be something that's easy for us to digest. If we're asking for answers to questions, easy for us to digest based on what they have to report to the state or to the city. Um, so I'm, I'm just kind of putting a fine point on what we're asking and how we, if we want to get real responses that we can react to, um, I, I guess it has to be backed up in a record that, you know, in one of these 300 page documents that they have to submit to the state. Um, like, Will, like Will was saying, you know, it's hard for us to dig through these documents to find these answers. You have these answers because you've done the work to do it, get it back to us. So I, I, I just wanted to make, kind of put that fine point as we're, we're trying to figure out what to ask them for, because if we ask them for something that they've already given to the state, it's easier for them to get without the PR and, and the other stuff. So I don't know if I'm. Yeah, but that makes that sense. Could. But then we're talking about the they who we're addressing this letter to. So we, we, we it looks like we essentially we need. We want something different. We want more from national grid, but we need. The city administrators in the conversation and our state representatives. Um, right, so. Yeah, but I think some of these answers are buried in those. Those responses that they made to the state that the, their staffs will have to like dig through I, that I guess I don't know. I just want to get answers and so if we're going to get a dance from. Different people, it's better to just. Have something that's on the record and easy for us to digest. I don't know. That's it. Yeah. Any any other thoughts, suggestions? Okay. So right now, the what I do, I'll take these bullet points, and I will I craft them into, you know, a actionable letter, and they are. Basically, just very generally speaking, um, much more ro robust uh, re outreach by National Grid to to the full extent to the community, to segments and um, residents who were not contacted during this whole process. Um, the uh, questioning the use of the I know they mentioned that it was a requirement, but 
the rebuilding this defunct trucking facility, um, the safety issues along, uh, related to that, um, I, uh, questioning their, the what you know the other pathways. Is this the fastest and best way to net zero? Um, and then related to we weren't really presented with data, so we need we need data. And to Eric's point, we need data that is digestible and usable. You know that that you know we can work with. Um, and data about the demand for right peak demand uh, vulnerabilities is that you know and then um, and then to Laura's point, real you know show us a real impact you know of, of that. So 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 is that um, can can I just add one thing? I want to revisit um, what what Kim had mentioned about reaching out to the mayor's office of sustainability, asking that office to send what was it a, a positive determination out regarding the facility i think like if we could request that that happen that would be helpful and constructive all right should we issue that in a, a separate at the board issue that in a second document maybe <laughs> i'm not positive what the best way would be to accomplish that but i think it would be productive all right, I'll consult with the uh, the board office on that. So we'll say we vote vote on a letter to be issued to the. It could the, be the same letter. I'm seeing um, from the chat. Kim was saying it could be in the same letter, so it doesn't have to be an independent okay. thing. But include uh, include that uh, that request for exactly. um, mentioning the po the positive declaration that needs to be filed. Okay. All right. So. Have a motion to to issue this letter based on those bullet points. I'll make a motion. And a second. Second. All right, Paul, Trina, motion. Or second. Okay. Uh, and I guess is it all all in favor? Say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Any uh, opposition? Abstention. Okay, motion is, motion carries. Okay. All right. All right. So that's uh, that's that item, and so now we're moving on to uh, a few more presentations. Um, uh, Alyssa and Greg, are you still with us? Okay, great. Thanks for uh, hanging in here yeah. on this. So appreciate yeah. that. So. Next up, we have um, uh, the from the Organics Committee of the Solid Waste Advisory Board um, with Greg and Alyssa. You can uh, go in further, but uh, we're really looking forward to their presentation. And um, who is who's going to drive the uh, the presentation? Uh, we're having some technical difficulties, so I'm going to try and share my screen. Okay. And if not, I can share mine. So. Uh, works. You might have to share yours, Greg, because I don't see the file here. Can you share? Can you share? Perfect. Perfect. Looking good. Great. And so just to say, Greg, Greg, you're you're your chair of this committee, and Alyssa, Greg, Greg Todd, and Alyssa Alberti, you're a member of the the committee. Is that correct? Correct. And so, you're you're joined by some colleagues uh, as well. Uh, yeah, we have Oliver. I'll do the introduction. Okay, great. Sounds great. good. Thanks okay. so much. Okay. Uh, so hello and thank you to the chair and members of the Environmental Protection Committee of CB1 for making the time for us to join you this evening. I'm Elisa Iberti, BK Squad member, as well as a member of CB1. I'm joined tonight by BK Squad chair and also a member of CB1, Oliver Wright, and Greg Todd, who heads the BK Swab Organics Committee. In the audience, I think we have other organics committee members and guests who will serve as resources as we provide some basic information. Slide, please. 
So who is the BK swab? And how do you get involved with the BK swab? Reasons to care about organics waste diversion. Why focus on organics waste diversion? Alternatives for collecting organics. And locally, what can a community board do to help? Slide, please. Who is the BK swab? The Solid Waste Advisory Boards were created in 1989 by the New York City Council to advise the borough president and city officials about solid waste issues. Pre-COVID, Brooklyn swabs were hosting monthly meetings at Brooklyn Borough Hall. Presently, all meetings have been held virtually on the first Monday of the month at 6.30 p.m. Meetings are open to the public. We hope that you take away from this presentation a link between our organic waste to climate change and highlight the many ways that New York City and specifically Brooklyn can participate in organics recycling. Slide, please. If you're not presently separating out household and yard waste to recycle, here are some reasons to care about organics waste diversion. Number one, once collected, organics currently moves through a complex web of local processing facilities, transfer stations, and composting facilities outside of the city. Two, organics left in the solid waste system also move via barges, rails, and trucks to disposal facilities outside of the city. Three, managing organics locally creates opportunities for both generating renewable energy and soil products if sufficient processing capacity were available. Four, by working locally to encourage our neighbors to recycle food, food scraps by diverting them along with yard waste from the landfills, we could help New York City reach equitable zero waste goals. Slide, please. Why focus on organics recovery? Very simply put, to reduce our waste by simply separating out our food scraps and yard waste and turn them back into compost to improve our soil. Slide, please. Here are some basic resources for alternatives to collecting organics locally that a community board can help to provide to the community. Remember to opt in for residential brown bin program, the brown bin program when DSNY relaunches the program later this fall in 2021. For now, consider using and publicizing food drop off sites. Click the link or dial 311 for additional information. For CB1, here are some local options. North Brooklyn Compost Project with a shout out to Katie Zwick in the audience. Row NYC drop off location at McCarran Park. Cafeteria Culture with a shout out to Organics Committee member Rhonda Keezer. Center for Zero Waste Design with a shout out to Organics Committee member Claire Mifflin. Try to support local micro haulers. BK Scrap Shuttle, Astoria Pug, and Vokashi, with shout outs to Clay Burke from BK Shuttle, Lou from Astoria Pug, and Organics Committee member Vondra Thornburg from Vokashi in the audience tonight. Slide, please. What can a community board do? Help inform residents of the importance and challenge of diverting food and yard waste, encourage prevention, donation, and active engagement in local collection systems. Consider sponsoring a competition to fund food scrap drop-off and processing facility in your community. Identify two or more local nonprofits to compete in the competition. Solicit financial support from local Chamber of Commerce, Business Improvement Districts, prominent businesses and citizens in the community. Obtain technical support from recognized composters in your community, the BK Swab, Brooklyn Botanical Garden, and nonprofit composters supported by DSNY. Slide, please. We invite you to get involved and email the BK Swab to join our mailing list or attend a meeting. Visit our website or our YouTube, or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. In leaving you to digest all of this, we would like to present a short video that sums this all by Nate and Hilla, who were here but had to leave. Um, but we want to say a special thanks to them as well. So, and I guarantee this video will be a little bit more engaging than the video we watched earlier. So, thank you.
Can you hear it? I don't think so. Yeah, there's no sound coming through. There's no sound, yeah. Ollie, are you able to enable that? It's not on our end. No, I know. All right, anyways, um, all right, I was muted. Um, trying to, I don't, I'm familiar with- the Maybe Greg could get it, maybe Ollie can get it up, Greg, if you wanna say a few words. If there's oh. any questions. I'm trying to look for the uh, Let me see sound if I options. Uh, can, is it playing now? I don't know. Ollie, oh, if you got it. I can try if you um, if you want to if you want to um, quit screen share. I can try and share mine. See if, if I, that works. Can I stop sharing? Yeah, if I can. Yeah. Stop. Sharing. Sorry about the technical technical oh, issues, guys. Yeah. Been... <laughs> happen there we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let, let me have a go then. See if this works. So. All right. <sighs> All right. Yes. Compost. Throw away the food waste, make it compost. What to do with that apple core? Be compost. Eat it and just put it where it all goes. Back to earth and nutrient rich compost. Don't throw away the food waste, make it compost. A slimy peel you have to deal put it in the trash bin like other packages but once it's in the trash and then the landfill what happens then in the landfill it doesn't get oxygen because not organic trash is piled on top of it so as it decomposes it releases methane a gas that's bad for noses and increases climate change but what if you could rearrange the molecules of matter that are left inside your apple cores and peels of your bananas and turn them into something you can use again and scatter into soil for the plant so that their fruit gets even fatter if you mix your rotting food with dried up roots and leaves it gives worms and microbes a tasty fruit to eat and when they eat it they digest it and it all goes back into the soil and we call that soil compost compost don't throw away that food waste make it compost what to do with that apple corn be compost eat it and just put it where it all goes compost don't get worried just get wormy. The pieces that you wouldn't eat, the worms eat in a hurry. Give the worms a home, poke tiny holes inside a bucket, but not too big a holes, so it won't let the bugs in. Or if you have a backyard, it isn't that hard to put your scraps in piles up in layers like a stack of cars. And if you have no backyard or live in an apartment, you can save it in your freezer, then donate it to a garden. Your food waste isn't waste, it actually makes wealth, cause everything is made from what was left from something else. The health of all depends on how a small thing decomposes. Don't throw it all away. Let it live again. Compost it. Consistently talking about cycles, microbial life will leave us with a brighter future. That is just nurture the kids. I'm talking about macro and micro organisms feed on the browns and greens. Another way to say this is carbon or nitrogen, or maybe even dead. Try with alive, but to get this black hole, just no ratios will be divine. From mesophilic to thermophilic, cooling in the cure step. It takes four stages to get compost just perfect. As we watch the heat and temperatures rise, we know our pile is broken. The bugs, bacteria, and fungi work together, that's for certain. Compost means community, so move as one unit. We all have a part to play. Interdependence is the movement, and we move it because we don't want no stinky you, smell. In aerobic conditions, prevent us from composting well. One thing I'll leave you with so that you know that you can do it too. First step is not to trash, but separate your scraps, they food. Compost, don't throw away that food waste, make it compost. What to do with that apple core, be compost. Eat it and just put it where it all goes. Back to earth and nutrient rich compost. Don't throw away that food waste, make it compost. Save your scraps, 
don't put them in the trash. Save, save your scraps, scraps, save your scraps. To the earth they go right back. Save, save your scraps, scraps, save your scraps. And put them in a pile. If that's a no-go, then go to a food scrap. Drop off sight and smile. Hmm. Happy, happy, happy. <laughs> All right, yeah. A little bit different tone there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was worth the wait. So um yeah, I had a question about the uh I got a call about that dialogue the various areas that are creating the compost, the different organizations say you you um, in terms of distributing, like if I, if I, if I had a, a garden in my backyard or say I'm on a park friends group and I wanted to use a little bit of that for you know, some, some of the beds, uh, how, um, how go about accessing that or if that if that's possible. Greg, do you want to answer that? Well, I mean, I would defer to your local partners up there. Uh, Astoria Pug, I know, for example, uh, processes a lot of compost. I mean, North Brooklyn too. compost also, Katie, we mm -hmm. can put you right. in touch with uh, mutual aid and, right. and them. So, yes, and uh, there's so many other people working with it right now. Yeah. Also on your, oh, could you put uh, the link to your website in the chat? Um, sure. That'd be cool. And it's only, do you, do you guys have numbers to showing, you know, just in terms of, um, you know, just you know the you know the climate impact by you know collecting organics, dropping them off, and then composting them versus just getting dumped into a landfill, um, that type of thing. Or do you know? Can you you have some of that off off you know just off the top of your head, just what that might look like? Well, I mean, I think it's something like four or five thousand tons a day of organics are um, taken to landfills in New York City every day. So, as that breaks down, it uh, in anaerobically, in the absence of oxygen in landfill, it becomes methane. So, if it does four to five thousand tons a day, um, yeah, you get a sense it's an, it's not a small number. <laughs> I don't have a um, a figure specific to carbon um but the from the um the waste characterization studies of residential waste that ts and y department of sanitation conducted um in 2017 the um the the trash so the the sort of residential trash um in the black bags that was going to landfill or incineration consisted of 40 percent um uh organic waste that could have been diverted to compost so just purely from a a waste collection perspective, you're looking at kind of almost, you know, over over a third of it could be um, could be reduced, basically, which is obviously massive. All right, does anyone else have questions, comments? One thing that I would like to say is that we're hoping that the brown bin program does come back, and we don't know how sanitation plans to solicit people because we think you have to opt in. So um, we'll keep you posted on what we would love for community leaders to try and help us. Okay, that's not a, that's not a, um, a done deal. That coming back. So it's um, the, uh, as it stands. Uh, excuse me, Dan, can Sorry. you mute your microphone, please? Thank you. Um, so in terms of the, the mayor's announcement and the way that it's, it, provisionally is going to be reenacted is that it, it's going to be restored in the neighborhoods that it was that it was in prior to it being cancelled when the COVID pandemic uh, came in. Um, but it's going to be done purely on an opt-in basis. So um, what's what's going to happen as far as we know is that um, every household in the city is going to get a, a, a sort of mail ballot saying, would you would you hypothetically like a brown bin for your food waste or organic waste scraps? Um, and then everyone has the opportunity to say, yes, I would like this or no, I wouldn't like this. And then that's going to be returned to the Department of Sanitation. And then initially in the neighborhoods where it existed previously, they're going to roll it out where the demand is there. And then any spare capacity will be expanded to other neighborhoods where there's the most, um, like the most uh, demand, but that's still being 
that's still being thrashed out so that that could well be subject to change um as far as i'm aware there will be a it is well it is on an opt-in basis for a start so it's not going to be mandatory so should you receive any communication related to organic waste coming through your door then the best thing to do is say yes i definitely want it because that will signal the demand to the department of sanitation I just want to say one more thing that all the people in the community that sort of stepped up to process the organics and, and get it sort of done and, and back to soil has been amazing uh, through this shutdown. So um, it, it's just really, really important that we think about it and um, sort of not ignore it, that we, we just get this done. It might be helpful to have a, a simple document with the different places within CB1 where people can bring their organic waste that we can, the community board can circulate. Okay. We can and get there that. Is a, the website, the sanitation department, DSAY, um, has a map, right? Is it still operation of drop off sites? I'm not sure if that includes things like North Brooklyn compost or not. So let us. Let us have a simple document. Right yeah. yeah, we can send one of those slides from the presentation to you because it's it's all there. So I'll send that to you, Steve. I'd just like to add one thing. Um, in Cooper's Park, there's a couple of wonderful people that collect over 800 pounds every Sunday. And they're doing it on their own and with bicycles. And um, and the neighborhood, uh, the neighbors all support it. So I, I think um, this coming weekend, I, I think our numbers are going to double very shortly. Yeah. So I'm just saying it's just, just regular folks just, you know, just taking care of it. And, you know, because we recognize the cities and uh, doesn't have the resources, but also um, our neighbors are doing a better job than sanitation was doing because this really is screen so that the, 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 the compost is just the best quality. Thank yeah, you. I agree. Thank you. Kim, Kim did you have a question? Or is that from before? I was curious, um, Oliver, will each like tenant like, in a building be getting those letters, for example, or does it go to a landlord? Uh, my understanding was that it was going to go to every household, um, but that's just my understanding. Um, so I, I think that will be the case, but I can't guarantee. Oh, okay. Do you do you have a, a dialogue with your with your landlord at the moment? Yes. So it may be worth ra raising it as something to look out for. It won't be till the fall in any case. Thanks. Did your landlord um, have it in the building before it was discontinued? Yes. Okay. So presumably he'll be open to opting in. <laughs> oh. All right. Anyone else? Um, okay. Thanks so much. Well, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks I really, really guys. appreciate yeah. it. And. Um, yeah, um, we'll see if you could if you could email me the presentation, sure. maybe you didn't write, but just so I include it in my report for sure. the committee. That'd be we'll great. Do. Okay. Thank Thanks you so much. Really, really important what you're doing. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you for having us and do keep in touch. All right. So next uh, we're moving on to we have some community updates. Uh, Anthony Vusareth from Northbrook and Neighbors, you, uh, Executive Director, are you in the house? I'm here. I'm here. Let's All right. See. Hey, the How's floor is yours. Okay. Um, so um, I need the, uh, I don't have a, I don't have a video, so I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, but I'll just go through, um, Steve asked for like some updates on some projects that we're working on. Um, so if I can have the presentation uh, ability. Yeah, I do. Um, so it's like, you know, Okay. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'll just um you know run through this pretty quickly. Um I'm sure you always can see it. I'm sorry. Okay. All right, so um, as you all know, we were started in 1994 with Neighbors Against Garbage, and then 
um, became uh, neighbors alive for good growth. Uh, one of the main things was to shut down um, a waste transfer station on the waterfront in 1998, it shuttered. Um, and then the demand was for it to become parkland. That parkland was designated in 2001 and it was opened in 14 years ago. It's now Marsha P. Uh, Johnson State Park. Um, <laughs> and then some other things that. Oh, um, I just saw Marty Markowitz in his shorts. Yeah, from some old, old school photos, right? Yeah. Um, uh, some other things we've been involved with over time, uh, the rezonings that happened in 05 and 09, power plants, tenant advocacy, water, uh, 197A plans, et cetera. So, uh, let me see what's going on next. so in 2018, uh, we uh, started a merger process with GWAP, uh, Greenpoint Waterfront Association for Parks and Planning. Um, I also joined the organization in June of that year. Um, and we changed our name to North Brooklyn Neighbors. Uh, and we focus on four major program areas around mental justice and health, land use of public space, mobility, infrastructure, and community capacity and resources. Um, what I'm gonna focus largely on is our environmental uh, justice and health work, just because it's relevant for this committee. So um, this is the largest area of the work that we do. Um, there are four uh, basic components to it. There's air quality, legacy toxins, toxic sites, and uh, Trash and waste. So, first, let's talk about some of the air quality stuff. So, the um, air quality, we have a neighborhood um, air monitoring initiative where we post, we uh, we work with our neighbors to host um, portable air monitors um, in the neighbor uh, around the community. We have air beams and we have purple air monitors. Um, we are hopefully going to announce pretty soon that we have um, uh, purple air at the Greenpoint Library, once we can assure that it's actually connected, um, we're having a little bit of an issue with that, but that'll be a one of our permanent sites. Um, it allows residents to um, check local air, it's a network that allows residents to check the local air quality um, and then track it over time. We also have used the data to um, kind of understand peaks and valleys in, uh, in what the local air quality has been, and then to kind of further analyze that. I'll get into that in a second. We also do anti idling work. Um, we've hosted workshops on how to actually make money off of reporting truck idling. Um, that the information is uh, on our website. We also actually um, have submitted uh, uh, a complaint and we're almost at the end of that. Uh, so hopefully, we'll be able to, in the next couple of weeks, hopefully, we'll be able to report back on how the process was. Uh, to actually make a complaint and then go through the hearing and eventually get paid for um, uh, for making complaints. And then finally, um, we are part um, of a campaign to get uh, zero emission school buses. Uh, That's part of a co uh, coalition with the New York League of Conservation Voters. Um, there is a bus depot on Norman Avenue in Greenpoint that um, is uh, actually part of uh, an effort to, that's being purchased by a new uh, city city supported nonprofit called Nice Bus. Uh, all the Reliant, there's a Reliant um, bus depot. Uh, the Reliant uh, company is being bought by a city nonprofit that's just being established. And a, f a few weeks ago, Mr. Uh, Mayor de Blasio, de Blasio announced that all the buses on the city funded uh, routes would be electric by 2035. Um, Reliant has a thousand routes. There, there are ten thousand routes in the city. So uh, Reliant um, has a th contracts for a thousand of them. So it's a pretty significant portion. Um, and and the good thing is that the Norman Avenue Depot is going to be maintained by the city, and it will be one of the first sites to have the electrical uh, electric vehicle uh, infrastructure established. So they're maintaining a the contract with the landlord I and mean, with the landowner. Um, so, uh, related to the air monitoring work, we have a partnership with NYU that actually allows us to expand that work. It's with, through their Department of Environmental Me Medicine. They have a Center for Investiga uh, Investigation of Environmental Hazards. Um, they actually support us as we kind of figure out what's actually in the air that folks are breathing. Um, it, you know, it's one thing to track for particular matter 
and other um, kind of hazards, but um, folks in the neighborhood are critically uh, interested in what types of um, contaminants they're potentially breathing in. Um, so we have a project that's funded through state DC uh, that allows us to uh, identify potential uh, uh, emitters and then host these kind of uh, this equipment uh, that will test the air at a given time. We've done several tests throughout the neighborhood. Um, we have a few more coming up next month. Um, and NYU actually helps us analyze that data. And then we've had a couple of uh, neighborhood stakeholder meetings to share back um, what some of the findings are so far. Um, but we hopefully by the fall or early winter, we'll have a full analysis of, um, of what comes from this monitoring. The other piece that they helped us with was create a RB study about um, North Brooklyn Air and Health. And so we had about 400, over 400 responders and two pieces of data that came out of that were, let me minimize this, sorry. Uh, two thirds of residents are moderately or extremely concerned about air, air pollution in the neighborhood. And uh, three times, residents who live near a construction site are three, three times more likely to report adverse symptoms compared to those who do not. Um, so those, those are just a couple of the findings that came from the uh, survey. Um, other work in, in this area includes, uh, we are uh, uh, technical assistance uh, partner with the state DC on the New Heart State Superfund. Right now, the site is rather dormant because there's a legal battle going on and it's up for auction. Um, so there's nothing actually happening at the site. Uh, I know that during, sometime during the pandemic, uh, there was a like some kind of people were getting into the building, um, and we worked with DC to ensure that the, the building was secured. It's really not I, a not a good idea to go inside there, especially um, in some of the basement areas. It's very hazardous to the human health. Um, we also host uh, workshops on lead and soils and do a lot of public commenting on legacy toxins. And then finally, um, last year we hosted a bag swap to get folks ready for um, the plastic bag ban, which hasn't really gone in effect that well, but you can report <laughs> uh, folks who aren't um, complying. Uh, and we also are part of campaign to reduce plastic reductions. We're really thrilled about a couple of weeks ago, the city council uh, made straws request only. Um, that goes into effect, I believe, in November. Uh, let's see. Um, so, you know, uh, another this is related to some of the environmental work we're doing. We have a, we're part of the North Brooklyn Open Space Coalition with El Puente, uh, New Country Alliance, and North Brooklyn Parks Alliance. And one of the things we recently did was we hosted a candidates forum uh, for the candidates in the 33rd and 34th Council District. We also had a kind of a, a pretty extensive uh, a, a questionnaire for them to, to talk about their positions on open space uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, you can find that on our website at northbrookenneighborhoods.org slash questionnaire. Um, you'll find all the responses. And then we'll, in, this near, in the near future, we'll be hiring a policy fellow that's gonna like kind of work between the organizations to work with community stakeholders um, to develop policy ideas um, around open space uh, for the community. Uh, sorry, a uh, couple of resources. We have a, a map, an interactive map on our website that was launched last year uh, called Eli. It, it's, it's a, there's a story map that, talk, that walks through kind of the environmental legacies, um, hazards in the neighborhood and how community fo uh, fought to, you know, for change. And then there's an interactive map that allows uh, you to kind of you know, add and, and review various layers and, uh, and to hone in on, on sites of interest. You also can use it as a site, uh, as an opportunity to organize. There's a way to tag things in the map that allows you to um, you know, flag things of in interest and then create opportunities to meet with neighbors around those, those um, points of interest. Um, and then finally, I wanted to mention we have a good neighbor initiative. This is not, this kind of sits between our environmental work and our, um, our land use work. Um, 
you know, because the neighborhood is you know, one of the one of the two neighborhoods in uh, community boards in Brooklyn that has uh, excess con construction, um, and a lot of that um, is as of right. Um, so what we do, what we've done is develop a kind of a template for neighbors to work with um, developers and those who are uh, demolishing uh, property near them, so that there can be some kind of agreement on communication on uh, monitoring and other issues that are um, of concern for local residents. Uh, just a, a quick list of some of the coalitions we're part of. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was thrilled to see Greg on. We're part of the, we worked on the campaign, uh, on an effort to save our compost, um, which is, you know, all about kind of re reinstituting a mandatory compost program citywide. Um, just a sampling of some of the uh, coalitions we're part of. Uh, always excited to have folks get involved with some of the work that we're doing. So th these are just a sampling of the types of opportunities um, that folks can uh, participate in if they're interested. And then finally, oh, if I'll take some questions if folks have questions and ways to stay connected to us. Great, that was awesome, Anthony. Thanks so much. Um, <clears throat> and um yeah it's just great amazing the, the work uh you and the organization are doing oh, thank for you. decades and you're continuing it um <laughs> and i just a couple of highlights just I've, I've noticed is just with the the school buses i feel like it's gigantic i mean the i mean some of the heaviest heaviest exhaust comes out of the uh out of, out of, out of buses if i understand correctly right and, and then the, the, the uh fleet right now is almost exclusively diesel Right. Um, and it not only affects the, the children on the bus, but their staff on the bus. And, right. and you know, it, and we have high rates of asthma already in the community, so it just exacerbates a, a, a chronic issue. Right, and they just sit there and idle, and I can't have the yeah. time, right? Yeah. And the, you know, the air monitoring, I'd say it was, you know, a little bit of a doubting Thomas. But, man, when you got some of those readings back, um, there's some real hot spots, right? There's some... Uh... Yeah, I mean, it, one of the things that was interesting, uh, we had one of the... Um, uh, master students at NYU did her thesis on our, on our air monitoring project. And one of the things she found was the dramatic decline or the dramatic improvement, or, or I should say, during the early parts of the pandemic. Um, and then how it like slowly uptick uh, uh, later in the summer and into the fall. Um, and then come, and to add to that, we've done some of the site testing and there are some not very good things um, in the air. Um, one of those silicate, a lot of construction dust is in the air. Um, it, we find it at almost every site that we've tested. Um, and, you know, some, it, the folks at NYU tell us that long-term exposure to silicate is not um, good. So that's one of the things that we'll uh, discuss in our report we'll release later in the year, but, just as a, as a red flag that there's a lot of construction dust in the air. Those guys were right. <laughs> you know, one thing, it would be great if the land use committee at, at CB1 could make use of whatever the, the document is that you guys have put together for developers in terms of their environmental responsibility to the community. Yeah, happy to share. I mean, we have three, and it couldn't have been done without Elisa Bierti, who was like helped spearhead that effort. Um, we have three sites on it: uh, 29 West Street, uh, one I'm escaping me also on West Street, but I just can't remember the address. And then also one the land lease uh, property that was just repurchased, or that doesn't have a, a, a pier right now for the ferry. <laughs> So yeah, those are the three. I'm happy to we're, we're happy to have post mobile. It's also a repository, so we keep all the documents and all the updates that they send. Um, so you can go back and look at the things that have been sent over time. But that could become a requirement when things come through. I mean, as of right, we can't don't have a say in it. But that we could the community board could direct people to you. Yeah, I mean, I can host it. Yeah, I can put the I'll put the link in the chat. Great. Anyone else have uh, questions, comments for Anthony? Well, this is, it's much easier than the national grid. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, okay. All right, well, hey, uh, thanks again. Really appreciate it. it. And uh, yeah. Um, yeah, if, um, you could also email me your presentation. That would be great. So I can include it in the report. I will, and then I'll also alert you guys. I'm happy to come back with folks from NYU um, when the report is ready. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me know and we'll we'll get you back in. I'd love to see that. Um, okay. Yeah. Very good. All right. Um, our next uh, update is from Newtown Creek Alliance. Mr. Willis Elkins. Hey, Stevie Chesler. I love the <laughs> here's here's um, Zoom alias. Um, okay, so um, I'm gonna try to keep this kind of brief because we've been on for a while and we've had a we've had some great presentations um, and talk a little bit. I don't have a presentation. I'll put some links in the chat to some of the specific um, topics. That I'll be discussing. So, you know, I wanted to focus on a few things. One is update about the Superfund process with the creek. Um, second is to talk about some recent developments around open space um, around Newtown Creek, and then to talk about some of our events very briefly. And please, if it, people have questions, put them in the chat or just interject. Um, I, I realize also a lot of people here are, are fairly engaged and informed and uh, and work with us on some of this stuff as well. So, first up, so with with the creek uh, cleanup with the Superfund process, you know, just as background, the creek was designated in 2010 as a as a national priorities list for the EPA uh, to clean up Newtown Creek. It is um, one of three federal Superfund sites in the city. And it's the largest, and we are ten and a half years in, and it has been um, as people like Laura Hoffman know has been a very uh, slow and long and uh, kind of painstaking process. Um, the phase that we're in right now is we are still at the end of the remedial investigation phase, which is basically trying to establish what the problem is in the creek. What kind of what kind of chemicals and toxins are in the sediments at the bottom? What risk do those pose to to humans and to wildlife? Um, are they moving around? Uh, all sorts of, I mean, they've collected millions of points of data um, to understand this. And the the draft of this remedial investigation report was first submitted in 2016, November of 2016. And this January is basically when we on the community side were first able to review a draft of it. So it's gone through four years, uh, the entire Trump presidency basically, of of going back and forth um, as background, it was the report was written submitted by um, the main responsible parties group uh, to the EPA, and then EPA gave comments back. Other responsible parties gave comments. Agencies like the state DEC gave comments, and so four years of back and forth on this massive report. We're talking like ten thousand pages of documents um, to understand what's wrong with the creek. Through the community advisory group, we submitted um, comments back just last month. We submitted those to the EPA, uh, like I think it's like a 14 page letter and it, it it's, it's somewhat technical. Um, okay, I was going to find that link and drop it in. Um, but basically, you know, it's, it's thoughts that we had about how, how the creek characterized and uh, things that they need to do as they sort of finish up the uh, the final version of this remedial investigation. And once that's complete, they, then they go to the next phase, which is about talking about how to how to fix these problems. And those things are going to be like dredging, potentially capping of the contaminants. So it's all very long <laughs> um, and painstaking, as I mentioned. The other the other sort of main thing that has been happening with Newtown Creek, the Superfund process is that we did get our first formal decision from EPA, um, which was in in relationship to combined sewage overflow. So for those who aren't familiar, when it rains, most rain events in New York City overwhelm our sewer system, and combined sewage, which is everything we flush down our toilets and everything it washes down the street, goes uh, backs up at the treatment plant and goes out to the creek. Uh, through these massive pipes and the creek is severely impacted by combined sewer overflow over a billion gallons of year of this entering the waterway 
And it's an issue for Superfund, not because of the, the sewage, the bacteria, because Superfund is about the chemicals. So it's all of the stuff that's on the street. So you think about these, like, like Anthony was talking, like a bus depot and all those buses that are leaving this parking lot, all of that, any fuel that's coming off of those vehicles, any of these industrial sites, anything that's on the street is also washing into the creek. And so you, there are chemicals that are entering with that in that billion gallons a year uh, of sewage overflow. And so the EPA went through this process to um, try and understand what the impacts are. And it's, it's kind of hard to <laughs> explain succinctly, but essentially they did this in advance of the full record decision about how to clean up the creek in large part so that the city could advance some of their current plans to reduce sewage overflow. And this, the short of it to say is that after as a formal process, um, I think some of you on even on this call attended these meetings we had pre COVID public hearings. There was one at PS 110 and submitted comments to uh, the EPA about this process. They received hundreds of comments from community members, elected leaders, uh, really concerned that they were not going to, that they were recommending a no action decision. And lo and behold, that's what they decided to go for is to to not require more capture, more volume captured than what the city is already doing, which is a 60% capture by 2042. So what that means is that it's going to take 25 years. The city is going to build out a massive underground storage tunnel. You can call it a pipeline, if you will, um, and and will that will reduce CSO volume by about 60%, and EPA basically said 60% is good enough for us. And so we're really concerned. Uh, we don't think that their process uh, was properly done. Uh, we don't think it's it's adequate reduction in the amount of sewage, combined sewage going into the creek. So um, I will again put this in the chat in just a second. Um, so that's sort of the major decision. And, and the summary of it is that here we are 10 and a half years in, the first major decision we've had from the EPA is basically a no further action. So members of the community advisory group have been very frustrated with this. We've had a lot of conversations with EPA about it. Um, they've tried to assure us that this is not uh, the final decision regarding sewage overflow. There will be one big decision for the entire creek uh, in a few years, and that has the ability to address sewage overflow. So. I don't know if there's any questions on that. I feel like this is probably <laughs> I'm trying to make it as simple as possible, but it is a kind of a complicated process of what's I think going you're on. doing a great job. Um, I, 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 I encourage people, which people who are not already on the CAG, but I, I, I attend the Newtown Creek um, advisory group. Um, they have monthly meetings. It's kind of dry and technical, but it's the belly of the beast, so to speak. There's a few bellies few beasts. Um, but you guys, I think you guys were amazing in your questioning of uh, the EPA the last meeting. And so when, you know, they keep putting out the comparison in, in the Gowanus Canal, the EPA is requiring the city to create these holding tanks for, you know, for the sewage, because if they let it go, it'll, it'll affect the, the dredging and the remediation work the EPA is doing. And so I'll pose a question, well, do you have the same situation in Newtown Creek? And they said, no, it's much bigger, et cetera, et cetera. And I just, I don't know. I just uh, feel like something's not right in Denmark there. Yeah, totally. And and it's kind of a process that they they made a decision there um, before the city made it there, before the city and state made their own decision. So, you know, it is, there's a lot of comparison to Gowanus. Uh, it's a much smaller site down there and a little bit simpler in some terms um but also it's been so much quicker i mean they they got the record decision uh we got our designation the same year they got the record decision a few years ago and we're still a few years away from it so it is really frustrating to see the progress yeah I, uh, you guys you pose a question if you know with with that remediation measure the 60 percent will the creek be swimmable and uh fishable you know, and the EPA's remedy, and they they haven't really answered that, have they? No, um, you know, they have one thing that sort of has happened in these in these ten years is that they they have established that the the toxins that are there do pose a risk, human health, and an ecological risk. So 
that, which, you know, may seem very apparent, um, but they have proved that through their own means, which, which basically ensures that there will be a cleanup uh, going forward. But, you know, the other aspect of it is, is that we have, you know, the EPA and we have these responsible parties. And so there is a lot of back and forth between those entities um, to design the studies, uh, collecting the data, generating the reports. Um, and so, you know, in some instances that may slow down the whole process, all that back and forth. Um, and we've certainly had concerns on the community advisory group side about the sort of um, the power, the ability that some of the responsible parties have to, to guide this whole process. So that's sort of what's happening on the, on the Superfund front. And definitely like recommend if people haven't been to the meetings, we have them every month. We have a really great facilitation team now um, to, to make these meetings like informing and engaging and efficient. Um, so you can sign up on the website I put in the chat for uh, announcements about when the meetings are. You can also apply to be a CAG member. And that's certainly something that um, I'm trying to see who's here. Well, Laura Hoffman is definitely a CAG member, has been since the very beginning heavily involved um i can't steve are you did you are you a tag member i'm not i just you're not, not. Yeah. so you know i would recommend like if if folks are interested in this apply oh sophie i think uh just joined as a CAG member so if you're interested please apply we don't have a threshold for how many members uh, we have it's a very i would say it's a pretty high functioning or like um you know everybody's kind of on the it's not a contentious group um so we welcome more participation um, as we go forward. And especially, I would say this too, especially from areas of community board one and especially areas of the community boards in Queens that are underrepresented at Greenpoint is, I would say, highly represented on the CAG. But, um, you know, if you're someone who, I'm looking at you, Kim, if you live in, in, in Bushwick area and you're concerned about the creek, um, uh, you know, we would welcome that that involvement as well. Um, not to throw another thing on Kim's plate, but she's the only one I know who, on here who lives in Bushwick. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, that's what that's what's happening with the CAG. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is a uh, positive change that's been happening around the creek. That's also been in many years in the works and relating to open space and. You know, just as a background with Newtown Creek Alliance, so much of our work has been primarily focused on this, uh, you know, cleaning up the creek, reducing uh, human health and environmental threats and harms. And I say we do a lot of work, you know, we're out on the water, we're patrolling the area, we're finding ongoing sources of pollution, unfortunately, that still exist um, and, and addressing those. Um, but in addition to that work, you know, we also do educational stuff and we also are advocates for access. And one of the you know, big issues is that Newtown Creek is so inaccessible um, to many people that live and work nearby. And, um, and so, you know, we feel like without the access, um, you can't fully engage uh, the communities of, of residents and workers uh, nearby. And, and we've kind of seen it. Greenpoint has basically all of the access to the creek is in Greenpoint at this point. The Queen side is, is really starved for that. And so uh, the Newtown Creek Nature Walk was really the first, uh, we refer to as like official access point, the first place where the city or the state or anybody uh, outside of community members had invested resources in connecting the community to the waterway. And so the first phase of the Nature Walk opened in 2007 as part of the Upgrade to the wastewater treatment plant um, by artist George Trackus and worked very closely with the Newtown Creek Monitoring Committee, people like Laura and Christine and, and Irene and others uh, to make that happen. And that's been a, a great asset um, for this community. But phase two and phase three of the Nature Walk had been planned for many years, and those finally came online last month. And one of the really interesting things about phase two and phase three is that it turns the park from a from a dead end nature walk. Um, into a continuous uh, waterfront walkway um, that actually opens up uh, not just space, but access. So if you're near, if you live in this area of Greenpoint near McGoldrick Park, you can basically walk down Kingsland Avenue and enter the nature walk from behind the treatment plant. And then you come out on the other side near the Pulaski Bridge, Manhattan Avenue, that whole area that um, obviously a lot of people have been living for many years, but is also rapidly developing as well. Likewise, if you live over 
Uh, I'll give more shout outs. If you live over where Laura does on DuPont Street, you can walk down the nature walk, come through the whole thing, and then end up on the other side near the Greenpoint Avenue bridge or walk over um, to, to McGulrick. So it's a really interesting um, connection in the neighborhood that I think a lot of us would agree Greenpoint is, you know, has a little bit of a divide and we can talk about McGinnis Boulevard and the role that plays in it. Um, so the nature walk is, is very interesting of how it, how it creates that. So um, definitely folks should go check it out. It's also, it's not a city park. It's maintained and managed by the DEP. And, and as such, it has a lot of interesting features and it was designed by an artist. So it's not your average park. There are all sorts of really interesting educational features and like literal artifacts uh, that are part of the landscape. The oldest, the, some of the oldest fossilized trees in the world are there just like, like their benches. <laughs> um, and so there's a lot of really cool uh, information and education. There's a whole table that has the, uh, the design of the monitor, the USS monitor, the course is built in Greenpoint. Uh, so it's really great. And I recommend people check that out. And then the other big piece of open space news near the creek is the under the Cambridge Park that opened yesterday, um, which is pretty amazing. This was built as part of the upgrade to the to the bridge, and the governor's office came in and put in some money to make this happen. And it was completed. It was actually completed last the end of last summer, but with COVID and everything else, uh, they they delayed the opening. Um, so, like the nature walk, it's open seven days a week, um, sunrise to sunset. And this is massive, seven acres, uh, a very different vibe than the nature walk. Um, and it is in a very heavy industrial area. So, I definitely recommend that people, you know, take that into consideration. Uh, there's a lot of truck, truck traffic over there, but it's seven acres of space uh, underneath the bridge and is a really unique spot. And so, that is being managed by the North Brooklyn Parks Alliance, and they're going to be doing a lot of programming on the weekends. Um, so I definitely recommend uh, people stay posted uh, and follow North Brooklyn Parks Alliance for events they're going to have uh, in the space and just go check it out if you're looking for open space and to, you know, get away from it all <laughs> in the industrial zone. Um, so those are the two major open space uh, pieces of news. There's other projects that NCA has been working on. Uh, related to open space. Uh, one of those is called the Gateway to Greenpoint, and we did raise some funding through Council Member Levin's office last year, right when COVID hit, um, to not the full budget, but it's a it's a parcel that's right at Greenpoint and Kingsland Avenue, and it was offered to the community many years ago by DEP as a community amenity, and we went through a whole planning process. Um, and so we are working with DEP right now to figure out a way that we can utilize those funds, although it's not the full budget for the project we envision, um, to create, to, to transform the space and turn it into something that's that's publicly accessible. So stay tuned for that as, as things develop. And the other thing, we haven't really announced this um, a lot publicly, but there's another project we've been working on, CB1, uh, on North Henry Street, uh, at the very end of North Henry Street, where it hits the creek and it's right near Phase three, the nature walk um, to rebuild its city owned property to reconstruct the shoreline in a, in an ecologically resilient fashion and create salt marsh habitat. And, um, we have, um, confirmation, uh, that the state is going to fund the project, um, to create salt marsh habitat in this stretch along North Henry street. So, so a lot to be sort of figured out with that, but all these projects that are. You know, that's happening near the nature, near the, near the new phase of the nature walk, um, near the gateway to Greenpoint. And of course, our offices um, are at the Kingsland Wildflowers building. And that sort of segues into my last thing, which is about events. So, Kingsland Wildflowers, for those who are uh, unfamiliar, is a 25,000 square foot green roof um, that is just across the street from the wastewater treatment plant. It's owned by Broadway Stages. Uh, we applied for money from the Greenpoint Community Environmental Fund to build out these green roofs uh, in conjunction with New York City Audubon and Alive Structures. And the green roof has been an amazing space for bringing groups, doing field trips, having open hours for people to come learn about the value of native plants and stormwater management. Um, and so we are finally beginning to reopen the roof as, as we're getting out of the COVID uh situation now and so um we do we are having events in fact our first one even though it may rain 
uh, our first open hours event is to tomorrow. Uh, we've been doing some other maintenance events as well. So if people want to come check out Kings and Wildflowers, it's a really unique space. Uh, we run a lot of educational programming out of there. Uh, it's on the creek. Um, you can see every, you can see the footprint of the Greenpoint oil spill from there. You can see the National Grid tanks, of course. You can see all this sort of stuff, the good, the bad, the ugly, and the potential for, um, you know, revitalizing this waterway in our, in our relationship to it. So, um, please check out our activities at Kings and Wildflowers. And then we also have some other outdoor events doing more cleanups and a lot of management of, um, of these planted areas that we've been doing more of around the creek. Um, we just this week, yesterday, was that, no, Tuesday and today, we did more um, uh, pollinator gardens at, at local schools, one in Long Island City and then one here in CB1 at um, Wasad, the Williamsburg High School of Ar Architecture and Design. So we've been doing a lot of work out in the field to try and increase habitat, uh, engage people, especially the youth and the students uh, in environmental issues. So I'll, I'll stop talking about, about the creek, but just put some links in there and reach out if folks wanna come see some of these spots. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Willis. Um, it's just tremendous what's going on for just the advocacy with the creek, I mean, it's a huge, such a huge uh, lift. So I'd appreciate, you know, the CAG in there, you know, uh, you know, belting it out with those agencies. And again, I was really impressed at the CAG. You guys really stuck it to them at the last meeting. And then, yeah, you know, just the open spaces. It's just, it's like you know, ter you know, greening that kind of industrial wasteland, you know, around the uh, Broadway stages and uh, treatment plant. I, I experienced the, the, the new phases of the uh, of the nature walk. I love it. It is just incredibly unique, kind of blending the industrial and the historical, and with um, you know with um, you know with, with plantings and you know, flora, and so really cool. And great to hear the you know the greenway still still alive. That's great. Um, so yeah. Anybody else have any questions or comments for Willis? Willis, would it be helpful for the community board to um, write a letter concerning the, the combined sewage overflow or is that? Yeah, we, that's a great question, Trina. We've talked about this a little bit internally. I think that we are looking to, and I think probably through NCA and Riverkeeper, um, write a letter that is um, very short and sweet and I think one of the things that we want to do specifically is get more support on the record from our elected leaders about this issue. There's really not like they're not going to change their decision right now, but there is a real opportunity to again get it on the record that this was not a good decision, the process was not good, and this needs to be reevaluated when they do the full decision for the creek. So um, we could consider having the community board sign on to that as well. Um, it's not ready to go yet, um, but yeah, that's that's sort of one thought that we were we were thinking. So, yeah, that's a great idea. I like that. I think it welcome the opportunity at the board to weigh in you know, at the yeah. right moment, you know, in the, in it, the process. So, yeah. yeah, and it's been tricky because the whole super fun process has been there hasn't been a lot to weigh in on, and so right. you know it has been tricky to get, you know, like community boards or, you know, offices of elected officials or, you know, groups that are not sort of in the weeds with it um, to come and, and participate because it's been sort of very slow and technical. So, um, yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Um, anyone else? All right. Um, well, thanks. Thanks again uh, for updating on that uh, and everyone. I know this is turning into a marathon uh, committee meeting here. Um, we just spent a few more minutes just going through. We have some new old business and new business. I'll just quickly mention member 34 Barry Street, the uh, Brownfield cleanup program. Where in the pro in the original, the original investigation, they thought it was just your standard operating cleanup they discovered there were these massive chlorinated solvent plumes and a big petroleum plume. And um, we had them in here. And uh, Laura, I want to credit you for putting putting out there, there should be a health study done. So, you know, our committee urged the board to do that. 
And we, I don't know if you saw, I don't, oh, I don't know if, I hope they sent it. Anyway, it was sent to the committee, to the board. The State Department of Health wrote back um, that they, you know, they did a thorough investigation, um, you know, with the, you know, with the cap and just tested for intrusion, vapor intrusion. You know, and they're going on record that they didn't find anything, you know, um, you know, big, you know, very big grain of salt, but I feel like, uh, I don't know, I feel, I feel good that we, you know, that we, 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 we put it out there and that they, they responded and they acted on it. So, um, I feel like our, you know, our board's doing, doing, doing its job. So, um, did you guys have to see that letter? Um, not a, I'll send it now. I didn't see that. What does the grain of salt um, have in mind there? Well, you know, it's this kind of, you know, um, <laughs> I mean, it looks, it looks very good. It looks like, you know, they, but I don't know. Um, you just never know, like, for sure. You never know for sure. That's right. I mean, the whole, what really prompted, the, you know, is this one woman who used to live in the building, moved across the street, said, we lived there for seven years. Her son um, had cancer, mm -hmm. you know, young young son, and he was in remission, but it's just, I don't know what type of cancer he had. It would been, was related to, potentially to either intrusion from petroleum or chlorinated solvent, but so uh, scary stuff. But, uh, but I applaud the committee and Laura and the board for, you know, Doing her job, you know. So, um, it's all business number one, and then the other one was um, three fifteen Barry. Um, the uh, battery storage units, and we covered the land use committee covered it in their last report just quickly. But you know, it's at the BSA. They had a hearing. Uh, BSA hit them really hard. Questioned them, um, you know. The, I think you, know, you guys probably heard it already, but they sent them back, you know, to, to go out for two months, get data on the integrity of the building, the structure of the building. But um, as you know, the uh, Jerry Jerry sent around, um, which I think he got from the BSA two years ago. There was a the thermal runaway of battery units in Arizona that uh, resulted in a horrible fire. Firemen were severely injured, um, and you know the, the the chair of the of the BS uh, the BSA basically said, "I just really wonder if these this belongs on top of residential building." Um, though the uh, microgrid said, "We're using a diff we're using different batteries. They they're not susceptible to thermal runaway." But um, and Ashley Thompson, who works for Capolino, the strategy consulting firm. Asked me if I would be, I would mediate between the tenants and microgrid. And so I, I asked the board for consultation, and Dallas basically said it would be unconscionable for us to take part in that based on, you know, this hit, this accident that happened two years ago. And um, so the answer was no. Um, so so that's that. And uh, and then just quickly, new business. The um, what I'll just kind of the MS4, which is the municipal separate storm sewer um, program that you have, you know, separating the storm sewer from the sewage system, which is combined, as Will is re um, referred to. And um, so they 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 put out a report periodically. But I just urge people to read it. There's a hearing. The hearing was today, actually. But I don't know if Willis, you want to say anything about it. Um, but um, it's um, something I just you know, we just you know, keep on top of. They, I think, specifically, they were dealing with uh, offenders who um, are who are illegally discharging chemicals and and whatnot into into the into the sewer system or the waterways. And ways that they're going to monitor that was one thing I saw, but um, but people you know take a look at that. Um, the other thing was the related to that was the the new rules by DP on um, digesters. You know where people have on-site facilities where they take organic waste, they put it 
it's it somewhat degrades and then they just launch it into the waterways and it's causing it's wreaking havoc on our you know our wastewater system so new but the the window for the common period is i think it ends on the 28th which is tomorrow but i don't know if we wanted to weigh in on that um even though it's almost 9 30. um you know we could just go on record and are there any in cd1 um well i think just because we have with 13 CSOs in the creek and four of them are just, you know, um, have insane volume. Um, and we have one of the largest treatment plants in the city, if not the biggest one. Um, so. Um, <laughs> do we is something we want to table and just comment when we comment? Um, Sorry, Steve, you're talking about the about. Um, um, the, Putting solids down the sinks or whatever. Sorry, I'm a little. Yeah, let me. Uh... Yeah, I, and there was some back and forth. Like Laura had chimed in about this that, you know, DEP doesn't want to encourage sink disposals um, because of the grease and the backup that it causes at the, the grease congeals in the pipes and it creates maintenance issues and things like that. Um, so, you know, I kind of get it and I mean, it's interesting. It's kind of a good sort of little segue to like Alyssa's presentation about yeah. you know, ways, ways we're handling organic waste. Um, but, you know, basically the city is, you know, said they don't, they're, they don't want people putting, um, food scraps, you know, down the drains and installing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah years ago, um, the NICMIC took a position on that because at the time it, you know it did have to it it did have an impact on the uh the upgrade and we decided to support DEP so as you know uh Nick Nick Mick is kind of an arm of uh the community board and um I mean I I would think that 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 decision you know, in that position would be upheld by the community. Okay. Um, what, what is Nick? Newtown Creek monitoring committee. Okay. So that's the, so that's the, the committee that was, uh, put in place. Via the ULERP, ULERP to oversee the sewage treatment facility upgrade. Um. I mean, we're, we're still, I mean, we're still kind of at active, but at the end of, uh, at, at the end of the process, I, I, I guess within maybe about a year, the NICMIC won't be around anymore, but, but right now we are. Okay. So do you feel good about it? If we basically, we just basically, we could just support the, the NICMIC um decision and we have to is this something you could forward to me do you is that um how do you conclude i i guess i would have to reach out to christine who was the liaison then to see where that that record would be all right all right um, well, do we want to vote on something tonight? Do we just want to basically agree with DEP or um, just to we want to table it and then we'll get the Nick Mick um, position and then vote on it uh, this time? Or... Yeah, is does somebody, do they, sorry, I missed this. Does somebody want a letter from us about it or? No, I just thought if we wanted to weigh in, like they yeah. have, have a comment period on this new rule. Oh yeah, but it it ends tomorrow, and they said it gives a few days extra. But, um, you know, we need more than a few days because the board doesn't meet again until June, first week of June, second week of June. So, um, we'll get us going record, even if it's after the fact. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's a, you know it's a general rule, you know, for the whole city. It's not just our district. 
but you know, it was sent to our committee. So, um, so. <laughs> maybe it's just uh, maybe just you know let it go. I mean, unless I mean, I feel like unless we just want to vote to support just in general, vote to support the rule. If you feel okay with that. Sure. Okay. So I was a good that. rule. Um, with like very little time to look at it. Just curiosities I had were like how they'll get businesses. I think it was focused on commercial versus residential, like um, what they need in terms of compliance, how long, uh, how they're going to monitor this, enforce enforce the rule. But you know, it's obviously like very new, so hard to look too deep into it. Yeah. Well, do we not? I mean, do we not feel? Properly informed to vote on it. I mean, um, I think just generally enfor enforcing, you know, just um, general enforcement of this, I think is good. I think it's a good thing. And I don't, I don't remember seeing any negatives other than, to your point, Dan, does it go far enough? You know, um, so. Um, so how about, how about a motion to, to support the uh, the rule? Second. Well, someone can make the motion. <laughs> I'll make the motion to support the rule. Okay. All right. All those in favor? Say aye. 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 Those against? Abstention? Motion passes. All right. All right, let me just make sure I have nothing else. Um, yeah, the rest I'll, I'll bring up in another one. I just, you know, I just, one of us is questioning the timing of so many of these things, like the, the brownfield cleanup programs. There's usually like a 30 or 45 day window. And with our community board cycle, we almost really have almost no time to make a comment and have the full board approve it. And especially we want a presentation, we want DEC or, or we, you know, to come in and present. Um, so I don't know, it's just something to think about. So I'm wondering about the timing of a full board meeting if someone suggests that, because um, I think it affects other committees as well. But, um, and another thing to think of is just, if you guys see those notices come in, for the volunteer cleanup programs, and one of them catches your eye. Like you live near there, you have a business near there, it looks hot to you, and maybe we want the DEC to come in and present about it. Please, please flag it and let me know. That's kind of what I've been doing. Um, a lot of them are coming through, but um, I know it's obviously we can't address every single one, but um, so something just to keep in mind um, with that. And um, and I had a question about 215 North 10th, which just came through. It's actually covering a whole block. Um, but that's, um, you know, um, again, that's another, that one they're just beginning to investigate. So let's keep an eye on that one and maybe bring in DEC on that. So, um, so that said, anyone have any, any final thoughts or any about anything? Um, uh, th thank you for it was a really long meeting, but obviously really important the national grid. Um, you know, uh, discuss, you know, presentation that was really important to have that. And, um, and sticking it out for the updates and the organics. So, um, yeah, I guess it's tis the season for long meetings, you know, for a reason. So. Steve, <laughs> is there a reason to meet next month? Seeing as we're having a July community board meeting, is, is there anything? Um, you need to meet about it. I, I, nothing comes to mind. If anyone, anyone else, uh, anything pressing that they want to meet next month on? There's going to be like, you know, 14 land use meetings. So. Um, no, I guess not. So I guess for now, no, if something comes up, then they will reschedule it. Otherwise, we'll see you guys in the fall when the land use committee and the environmental protection committee. So. Uh, that said, um, I guess we will adjourn. So th thanks again, everyone. Thanks, uh, Marie.
staying late and running the meeting and everyone in the community who uh, stuck it out and participated tonight. So, Thank you, Steve, for uh, running this meeting and getting National Grid to come chat with us. Glad to do it. Yeah. Right, power to the people. All right. <laughs> good job. All right, thanks. All right, have a good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. All right, let me uh, copy the chat real quick. Okay, got it. All right, have a good night.